one of the main reasons I wanted to get you in here is uh, not only because your work is incredible, but the the cartels in Mexico and Central and South America are, uh, you know better than anybody, one of the most misunderstood topics. Yeah. And being a journalist in Mexico covering the cartels has got to be one of the most dangerous jobs on earth. Definitely, man. They, it, it, it really is. It really is. What the hell is going on in Mexico? Well, man, in Mexico, it's always something going on and, and, and it's been crazy for some years now. But I think it's just in recent years, maybe the last, uh, I guess, the last decade, things are really going off rails, you know. Um, cartels are overpassing the power of uh, even politicians or, you know, like the, the, the government. And they've been receiving so much support by the U.S., you know, like a lot of uh, U.S. Um, trained uh, um, police officers or Mexican military are going to work with the cartel, so you can you can uh, sort of like guess what's uh, what's that like? You know, like those guys are properly equipped, properly trained, uh, hard to fight on, and they and in Mexico, as you know, there's a lot of well, and I, I think la all Latin America, the corruption is ramping. You know, it's 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 crazy the levels of corruption. That, that what made you want to like get into this world and cover all this stuff and document these things going on and embed yourself with these cartels? Like what made you want to do? I mean, it's a fucking dangerous thing to do. Like what was it that got you into it? It uh, it is, man. I mean, I think I think what got me in was the fact that I grew up in Ciudad Juarez. I was uh, born and raised in, in Ciudad Juarez in this border city just across El Paso, Texas. And back then, I grew up in the 90s and in the 90s Everybody was talking about narcos, you know, like about um, Amado Carrillo, El Señor de los Cielos, The Lord of the Sky, and all, all of those guys. But they, were, they weren't talking as we're talking right now, you know, like they're like dangerous people and, and they can be ruthless and violent. They were talking like if you're talking about Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, you know, like everybody was like, wow, Amado Carrillo is cool, man. He has uh, like three wives on the same school, uh, the same school, his kids to where I went to, to, to school with two of his kids. So it was some glamour, I guess, around mm -hmm. his, uh, around like all narcos. But to me, it was really confusing because I grew up in that. And then when I came like to, I don't know, maybe a secondary school, uh, middle school, um, I was so confused because then everybody started talking about how they were being violent and my parents, um, they're, they're sort of like wealthy in, in the city. So they've always lived in, in, a, in, a, in a world neighborhood. Uh, and all of a sudden, like, they, they started like expelling narcos from the neighborhoods, you know, like, because before the, you will have a neighborhood and, and Amado Carrillo and all those, those guys were, were living um, on, the, on the, the, the house next to yours. Um, but out of, all of a sudden, they were like, okay, we don't want these guys because they're violent and they're bad and they're doing bad, bad shit. So they started basically outcasting them. So that shift made me, I don't know, confused. Made me like, what is going on in my city? What's going on in my country? Uh, I grew up with, with those guys. I know some of the, his kids and everything. And now they're like sort of like outcasts. And then when I started growing up also, like in 2010, I was... Um, I guess 18 or something like that, the whole um, violence broke loose in, in my city. Ciudad Juarez, as you know, was uh, once um, called the, 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 the um, murder capital of the world because we had so many killings. The The rate was like 13 killings a day. So How many a day? 13. Holy shit. Yeah, it, was, it was fucking crazy, man. And I remember that I was, um, that I, every time I went out, I had a, a motorcycle, so every time I went out, and then we'll go back into the gated community where my parents live. Uh, I was like, fuck, man, I made it another day, you know. Um, I got five of my friends killed in the same event, in the same uh, place. So Five yeah. of your friends were killed in, at one place at, at one, one place, time? Yeah, at, 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 a, at a bar. Um, what? In, yeah, in How did bars. that happen? I, I'm not sure if they uh, confused them for, <clears throat> for someone else or it was because uh, another guy told me that they got into a fight in a different bar over a girl. And apparently she was with one of these bad guys. So he had them followed and he just shut up at the bar and killed everybody. So, but that was, that was fucking crazy. Cause I mean, I was supposed to be at that bar that night, you know, we we're supposed to go all together, but, but I uh, overslept in my, in my, in my house. So I woke up at three in the morning 
in getting all these calls from my editors about five young kids being killed in a bar because I was already writing for, for, for news. Um, so I showed up there and it's all my, all my friends. So no yeah, that was, that was man. fucking crazy, man. That changed my life uh, a lot. And since then I started like wondering what happened to them. And then I, I realized that it doesn't really matter what happened to them because it keeps happening to everyone. But the, the, um, the thing that matters is it's like, why? Who's moving these, this issue, you know, who's really behind the whole thing and how this shit works. Yeah. So I, I think that's the, that's how I got to, to jump into, into this. Is the CIA working with the cartels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, short short answer is yes. They are. <laughs> yeah, man. Not only the CIA, also, I guess every other agency in the U.S. or every every three lettered agency in the U.S. DEA, is CIA, yeah. FBI. You know, like most of those guys are collaborating with with narcos, uh, not only in Mexico but all through Latin America, man. And I mean, they're not. It's not like they're you know like smuggling drugs themselves. But it's like they're breaking deals. Um, you know, uh, el, el narco, um, the drug traffickers in Mexico, the issue has gotten so big right now that it is easily, uh, it's very easy to, to unstabilize a country through, through el narco, you know, through violence, through drug trafficking mm. and all of that shit. And, and <coughs> I know for a fact that some of these narcos, they don't even know they're being played by by US agencies to to destabilize um you know the Mexican government or Mexican forces you know so what is what specifically is the US's involvement with these cartels like you told me to watch that that documentary on Amazon Prime the last i think it's called the last narc the last narc mm -hmm. um who, who was the guy's name the, it was the Mexican DEA agent mm -hmm. who was basically murdered by um, so a couple drug lords, and mm -hmm. there was a famous or a very well known CIA clandestine CIA agent there, mm -hmm. yeah. Felix Rodriguez. Exactly. Um, and they murdered this guy, this guy who worked for the DEA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what is their specific involvement, and what is in it? What is the incentive to work together? I think uh, the, the involvement has a lot of layers. So one of the one of the main layers is um, I don't know supplying. Um, aircrafts or legal entrance under the radar to drug into the U.S. I guess that's something that the U.S. has offered before, but um, there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of collaboration out in the open. Um, talking about El Mayo, you know El Mayo Zambada, it's basically like the biggest narco now in Mexico. He has always been El Mayo. El Mayo. He's uh, he started before El Chapo Guzman, and El Chapo Guzman was actually working under under El Mayo Zambada. The thing is, like, he's too shadowy. No one, no one really knows where he is. There's only one photo of him on the internet. Really? So no one has really, and, and that photo, it's like from the '80s or '90s, some shit like that. Dude must be old. So he's old now. He's old now, and he's always been around. He has his people. Um, I was personally. Uh, at a at a at a party, a party uh, recently in Culiacan with uh, with his security people, he's he's basically his sicarios, his hitman group, um, and he's he's still at, in the mountains controlling the whole fucking business from Sinaloa. Um, no one really knows where he is, how he looks right now. He's been too too shadowy, but the thing is, most two or three of his sons were arrested in the U.S. in different um, occasions, right? Like So mm. 2013, one of his son was arrested in Nogales, and then another one in, I think, San Diego, something like that. And that family keeps deucing both governments, keeps, uh, keep, they, they're keeping out of trouble like El Chapo, right? El Chapo got life sentence. And these three kids of him knowingly um, by the U.S. that they were trafficking and working under the biggest organization in latin america which is the sinaloa cartel mm -hmm. um they're breaking deals with with everybody so they're in the u.s one of them it's actually free to go back and forth mexico as a as a legal permanent resident of the u.s the other guy just got his uh, sentence reduced so i think he's gonna go out next month from yale and the other guy received um he got I think he, they they changed his whole identity and he got like legal status to stay in the in the U.S. with his family and everything and no one really know where he is and and El Mayo is still free, 
So when you when you see that, there has to be some involvement, right? I mean, it's not it's not like they they hired super fucking great lawyers that they can you know do whatever they want. It's because they're breaking deals with the U.S. Yeah, the one I have a really good friend who's actually a lawyer who has represented some big drug lords in, I don't think Mexico, but definitely Colombia. Mm -hmm. And the way he describes the whole war on drugs to me is this: he says these guys who are hiring him to represent him, they'll they'll fly him first class to Colombia, mm -hmm. and they'll meet in like he'll be instructed to go to a lobby of a hotel and they call him up whenever they're ready. Yeah. And these guys do not get in trouble. These guys stay out of, out of jail. They stay out of trouble completely. The guys who get in trouble are like the low level pawns. Yeah. Like the guys who are captaining the boats or picking up cargo or making shipments or, or moving shit around. Mm -hmm. Like it's the poor people yeah. who are like the foot soldiers are the ones that are getting in trouble and getting busted. Exactly. Definitely, man. And that's, that's, th th and, and that's like, let's let's call it like the simplest collaboration right now talking about all the um i don't know if you if you know this um operation called iniciativa merida initiative merida initiative mm -hmm. where it's basically the u.s funding millions and millions of dollars to you to mexican security forces so they can fight against the the, the narcos right they're basically funding um weapons <coughs> um vehicles uh, airplanes uh, um training uh, so and all of that, that stuff is ending up working for the narcos, right? Because Mexico is so corrupt as well, and the U.S. has done nothing but just wash their hands and say like, okay, we're just gonna train you and give you a lot of money, and good luck with the uh, fighting the fucking cartels. Um, a whole fucking town was killed by an elite group that was actually trained uh, with the U.S. Marines, and so they were initially they were Mexican military elite group. They got like the best training with the best of the best in the U.S., like from Navy SEALs and all that shit. Oh, so these guys were these guys actually were like born in Mexico, <coughs> moved to the U.S., and and were recruited by the army or the but Marines. The, the, and they the, got they were officially trained by both countries, right? Like so, Mexico okay. said like, okay, I need these people trained because they're like uh, Mexican top elite military. Okay. So they trained them, and after training and giving them equipment and, and everything, they started fleeing the the Mexican military and jumping and going to work uh, with a cartel with Los Zetas. Uh, but they still got a lot of uh, links and contacts inside the Mexican government. So there was a time when the, the Zetas had, um, had a snitch inside them. So the snitch was giving information to the U.S. authorities, to the DEA specifically, about the movement of these guys, where these guys were um, shipping drugs from cargo so they started like busting a lot of cargoes from Los Zetas, right the thing is the DEA called uh, the Mexican army and said like hey we got a, a snitch on, on your side and I think you should talk to him he's a pretty good contact he's inside Los Zetas not that shit and of course that that group in the in the army leaked the information to Los Zetas, right because they were getting money so they're like mm. hey guys watch out you gotta you gotta snitch on your side and i'm getting this information from the dea directly and that's why you're getting a lot of uh, drug busts and what they did because they they didn't know who who uh, the rat was so what they did is they killed a whole fucking town in one night one day a whole uh, we're talking about like a whole families a whole fucking town how many people it was by the hundreds jesus so they kill a whole fucking town how long ago is this uh, I think it was in 2011 or something like some, some, 2011 something, something like that. There is a there is a, a Netflix show, uh, a series called Somos. Somos, yeah, I've and, heard of that. Exactly, and and it's about that massacre, man. And, and that was that was fucking crazy, and that's another proof of the involvement of the U.S. Right, sharing information with people that is not properly vetted, right, uh, not taking care of their informants, all that shit, and they're breaking deals with everyone. Um, right now, just coming um, here, mm. I was a bit late, a few minutes late, because I got a call from a guy who works with uh, with a criminal organization in the in the Sonora, in Sonora State at the border with Arizona. And he was, uh, I've been in touch with him recently, talking about fentanyl and all that shit. Yeah. And he was like, "Hey, man, you know what? I want, I really want out, and I really need out from 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 the cartel because things are getting crazier and crazier for me and my family. Yeah. So I don't know if you know someone in the U.S. government that wants information and that I can share info with, but 
if they can relocate me to the US, I will share the whole fucking shit, like who's dealing fentanyl and all that stuff. And I'm like, dude, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, that's pretty fucking tricky, you know? Uh, that's something I've never done, and I don't know if it's actually, if it actually works like that. But good luck, you know? I, so I he wish wants out of the cartel, and he wants protection from uh -huh, the US, from, yeah, from exactly. the DEA or mm -hmm. the CIA or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we're talking that ha that happening a lot, you know? And the US playing playing along those lines as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a crazy thing because I mean I feel like even if you did do that, you would still they still the cartel can still find ways in the yeah, U.S. to totally. kill somebody, right? Yeah, for sure. Oh uh, yeah. What what is it like? How do you embed yourself with these groups of people, and how do you get them to trust you when you're? Are you like filming shit, or do you just like wh what do you document? And how do you document it when you meet up with these people and you stay with them? Um, I. I have I have a lot of years working on the same beat and doing the same and learning the bad way. Um, I've had two uh, guns to my head before uh, that I, that I thought that I was gonna die uh, right there, and I yeah, learned. You got kidnapped, right? I got kidnapped, yeah. So in Ciudad Juarez by the local police, by the way, <laughs> it was not even you know who like all clearly worked for the cartels. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they I got kidnapped by by the local police once. And I got um, locked up in a in a warehouse by another fucking uh, guy who was a cartel member. Um, so I, I learned the bad way. But what I learned is to be completely honest and clear about my intentions with these people, right? Not faking that I'm friends, not faking that I'm on their side, not faking, faking that uh, anything. And also letting them know that some of my sources also are on the other side of the of the of the spectrum right that i have sources in the dea in the fbi uh, inside cia and that i'm not and that i'm talking to them in the same way that i'm talking to 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 these other bad guys you know that i'm making them super clear that i don't believe in good guys and bad guys that i i understand that everything is a grayscale and and there is good guys that do bad shit and bad guys that does uh, good shit and all that stuff so i guess that's how they that's how they feel comfortable sharing a lot of their stuff with me and because i've never betrayed uh, betrayed um anyone right i've never had to call you know uh, authorities or someone and say like hey here is a huge fucking bus a few huge fucking load of whatever drug right. or something like that or the other way around right a U.S. agent tell, telling them to, to those guys, like, you know, this agent is investigating you, is after you, or whatever. Yeah. I keep all that shit to, to myself because it's not worth it. It's a, it's a, it's a fucking game that no one's going to fucking win, and I don't want to be in the middle, right? I'm just there to, to tell stories, to bring light into what's happening, trying to educate um, readers in Mexico and the U.S. about what really is going on and, and why is uh, and who's playing behind these fucking forces right mm. um and i think that's uh that and and time gave me the access that i have inside some of the organizations many people are pretty pretty scared to to go and to embed with uh with narcos and and i'm not saying i'm not but um but I don't know, I guess like to me it's like there's an opportunity. These guys say like, hey man, I've been reading and watching your reports um, and somehow I feel like I trust you, that I can trust you for the way you protect your sources, for the way you don't share like specifics on any information. Do you want access to this or do you want access to that? And I'm like, fuck yes. And I take every single opportunity I can get, you know. Of course, if it's if it's worth it and if I feel um safe enough if you can call it that what's in it for them for you to report and like write this shit about them <coughs> make documentaries about them like what do you what do they think about that shit? you have to know that the the um the way social media is playing now is making everybody wanting to show what they do for a living you know you have car sellers you have i don't know water sellers yeah. you have drug sellers drug traffickers killers and many are attracted by the fact that they and their work can be out there without actually no one really knowing who is who. And that's uh, that's an, uh, that's something that attracts them. That I find that that they want to share. You know, if you will look at my um, WhatsApp or Signal or Telegram right now, 
it's fucking loaded with a lot of shit, you know, a lot of cargoes, a lot of guns, a lot of, you know, stuff that they keep sending me because they're like, hey, dude, watch this. They watch want that. like the, ano- it's like anonymous clout. Almost. Exactly. It's, it's, it's weird. I know it's a, it sounds weird, but they, they're just like that, you know, like they, they want to, they want to show what they do. They want to feel important. Uh, remember that by the time you are inside the narco and you have a narco corrido in your name, that's huge. You have a song, someone is singing about you. Yeah. And that's fucking huge for them. That's that's when they feel they made it, you know? That's like, okay, I have my own Do you think these now. guys like aspire to be like El Chapo or Pablo Escobar? Like, <clears throat> I think so. I think really? so pretty much. Those guys, I mean, those guys pretty much think that they're going to be the next the next one up, right? Um, and especially because they most of them, they start um, early. They start very young. So they start looking up to El Chapo or to El Mayo right now. They call him um, El Señor del Sombrero, the uh, the man of the hat, and that's a that's a that's a key word to talk about the real boss of the Sinaloa cartel, right? If you see someone with a with a vaquero hat, you know, a cowboy hat on the cap, or who has a, a hat on the um, <clears throat> hanging from their mirror, you will know that those guys praise or work for El Señor del Sombrero, right? So they want to be El Señor del Sombrero. They want to be that. And they're super young. I mean, of course, if they last enough to turn 30, 40 years mm-hmm. inside the cartel, that's when they start getting disappointed and saying like, shit, man, it's not like that. It doesn't yeah, work. bro, the <laughs> life expectancy of somebody who starts working for the cartel at a young age must not be that high. Because you yeah. got like even El Chapo, like I didn't, was that, that's something I didn't realize about El Chapo that I learned from that documentary was that he was fucking slaying and butchering people at a super young age. Super young age, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you if you um, saw the um, a story I posted on my Instagram recently. I think it was like two days ago about one of the youngest sicarios for the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, which is a ruthless cartel. Um, and he was like, what, maybe nine years old? I mean, the, 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 the weapon he had on himself was bigger than than him he, he had like a huge i don't know if it was like an ak or kind of fucking weapon but it was huge really? and you can you can watch his face and he's a, he's a kid i of course I, I i posted that and i covered his eyes to sort of like protect his identity yeah um but, but he's a, a worker for the cartel he's a worker for the cartel man and he's like super super young let, let me see if i still <laughs> have the photo of him because he really looks like i mean if he's Is he on he, your instagram it, it's on my Instagram, I think. Where I we got it right here, so we can pull it up. I think it was on one of my stories. I don't know oh, if it's. Oh, uh, Okay. I don't know if it uh, expired. Okay. But uh, but yeah, man. I mean, he 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 looked like if it was if he was twelve years. Look, there he is. Jesus Christ, I mean, man! How how old does he look? He's like, like a to- just barely a toddler. Yeah, exactly, man. <sighs> And uh, I know that this you guy. You took that photo? <laughs> no, one, okay. one, of, one, of the, uh, one of the guys working on the Cartel Jalisco sent it to me, sent it over. And said, like, look at uh, look, uh, uh, the soldiers of the Cartel Jalisco. And then I posted that, and then I covered his, his face and everything. And then another guy from another cartel fighting the Cartel Jalisco sent me a DM and, and said, like, uh, something like, poor kid, he's dead now. And he's dead like, already? And, and I asked him, like, is he dead? He's like, no, but we're, we're after him. I mean, he's going to die uh, young. So, yeah. I'm like, shit, man. But he's a kid, you know? Can you fucking leave him alone? Just scare, scare him and have him out? You know? And, and he's like, no, nah, it's not like that. Dude, like, that's so fuck, fucked man. up, man. So scary. <clears throat> yeah, man. Yeah, It's yeah. a different fucking world there. How does a kid end up in the fucking cartel at nine years old? Is it just like his... his parents in the cartel or like is it just that way is just like you're born and you if you if you're poor and you grow up on the streets you it's hard to not get into the heart cartel you know it's um i know i i, I know like the um sort of like the story of that guy, of that kid he, he doesn't have a dad he has a, a mom that she knows what he's doing but still she treats him like like a kid i mean he had a birthday cake on on his i think it was like 10th birthday or some shit like that like a kid so they're just normalizing mexico it's normalizing violence like Mm -hmm. everything it's getting to a level where a new incident that happens like younger kids the first we are like 
super scared and alarmed about that, right? We were like, fuck, man, they're super young. But then you have another news where a nine-year-old kid was shot dead and, and this and that, and then you start normalizing the whole fucking violence. And that's happening in Mexico a lot. And 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 that's what what is worrying me, you know? Like, it's like, dude, this is not normal. This is everything but fucking normal what's happening in Mexico. And to answer your question on how these kids um, end up working with, with the cartel, a lot of a lot of rural Mexico is uh, is, is super poor. There's there's no help from anyone. Basically, you will have to do a lot of shit to get food to your table. You know, like it's it's really like that. Or education, roads, no work at all. So that's a gap by the government. And every gap that the government has, the narco steps in and covers for that gap right you need schools i'm gonna bring it in right you need food i'm gonna bring it in you need work i have work for you so that's why i say everything is a grayscale because it's like all right what what are they supposed to do right Mm. to to die of of hunger to leave their parents to die at the town and go to the city to work which was was what well chapo did um what are they supposed to do if the government is not taking care of them or anyone you know like citizens like like myself or no one is really taking care of them and their needs there's only one group that is actually taking care of them and it's the narco and what do they get in return the loyalty of a whole fucking town right so when militaries come in they start blocking fighting or um snitching on them and say like hey the military is coming be careful right right it's like what am i gonna do am i gonna bust my ass and struggle and try to you know whatever work in a fucking <coughs> in a cornfield or or do some other fucking mm-hmm. manual labor for pennies yeah or do this mm-hmm. get a fucking gun and kill some people and make tens of thousands of dollars yeah exactly and it's not like for for my experience it's not like the uh the cartel is enticing them or you know like forcing them to work just everybody knows about it right they're just around yeah. all the time <clears throat> but they, they are the only ones with the huge pickup trucks you know with the blings and oh, the guns really? and everything. So they're like, dude, I want to be like them. They have like cool fucking pickup trucks. And my neighbor is 15 years old and he has already an ATB and, and, and a pickup, you know. So they're like, hey, dude, where do you get that pickup from? And it's like from, I don't know, they usually have a name, right? From from El Tilin or from El Cholo or from yeah. whatever. And it's like, dude, can you tell him if, uh, if I can go into? And it's like, for sure. And those guys are like, yeah, why not? How did and why do you think El Chapo got busted? And how did how did he end up in prison in the U.S.? Because you think that he would be somebody who would remain fucking untouched like mm-hmm. El Mayo. El Chapo was never the boss of the Sinaloa cartel. He was he was he was never the no he was never the boss of the Sinaloa cartel. Not at all. Uh, you know, most of the people don't don't know or don't grasp the idea that the Sinaloa cartel was not born in Sinaloa. It was born in L.A. That's where the Sinaloa cartel actually grew and was born. It's in Los it, Angeles. In Los Angeles, that's the that's the that's the the the, um, the um, basically the cradle of of the of the Sinaloa cartel. El Mayo Zambada was one of the founders, along with a Cuban man that I forget his name right now. That was uh that was like the father in in, in law or something like that like for El Mayo, uh, and they both were immigrants uh, living in L.A. and they started. Because the first thing you need to be a successful trafficker is a buyer, right? You can have all the products you you want, but if you don't have a buyer, you have, you have nowhere to go, no money to make. So these two guys made a whole network of buyers in, in L.A., and they started moving the money. They started, they, they knew the place, they knew Sinaloa, they had family there. So they started, like, making the strings, uh, the first time the Sinaloa cartel became a cartel, it was s- established in L.A. from from buyers in L.A. And what was what were they selling? Cocaine, weed, uh, weed, weed. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It was it was weed at the at the, at the very beginning, uh, but also like the first established connection to bring huge loads for the Sinaloa cartel of cocaine were uh, as well buyers in LA. Wait, was that in the 80s? That was in the 80s, yeah. Okay, so like that a, was like Roger Reeves <coughs> exactly. era. Yeah. era. Mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. So that's 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 the like the, the first thing, right? And the thing El Chapo grew up in in in, in Badiraguato, a very small town in Sinaloa. 
someone gave him a job, right? Someone hired him first to uh, wash the, the cars, you know, like to actually yeah. clean the cars and the shit. And, and got like more involvement. But what he had was a huge fucking ego and a f huge fucking necessity to be recognized other than a little Indio from the mountains, right? Mm -hmm. He wanted to be someone else. And I guess that served his, its purpose for the cartel. He's like, oh, so you want to be important, right? You want to be someone. So why aren't you, why aren't you the, the face of the cartel, you know? Go out there. Have the money. Have everything you want. You're the fucking face. Well, we run the cartel from behind, talking about El Mayo and talking about white-collar people, right? Like lawyers, politicians, business owners, and all that stuff. There were, like, as soon as he's willing to put his fucking face out there, <sighs> like, we're good, man. Have, have at it. And he did. He wanted to make a fucking film. He wanted to make documentaries. Um, the the um, so the, what was he doing? At? What was his his role at the peak of his involvement? I guess he was like a manager for the whole thing. Okay. It's like if you had I don't know a, a store in this place, and I'm the real owner. I'm the I'm the one with the money, with the hooks, with everything. With everything. But I'm like, okay, I'm getting the money, the big bucks. Do you want to take care of this and be the face to, the, to our clients? He's like the Ronald McDonald. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> El Chapo is like the Ronald McDonald <laughs> for the Sinaloa cartel. And once his purpose stopped serving the real owners, they deliver himself. They, 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 they deliver him. They were like, fuck it. It's not. We'll give you Chapo. Exactly, because he was too flashy by then, right? Every fucking body knew his face, his whereabouts. Everybody knew his whole family. I have most of his family on my Instagram account, and they still have a lot of fucking money, man. What he's, do you mean uh, on your Instagram account? They have Instagram accounts, and they're. I mean, they're following you. They're following me. I'm following them, man. Yeah, yeah. And they're they, wow, most of them are bro. living in the U.S. They don't even many don't even speak Spanish, man. <laughs> really? <laughs> he's um he has a a two or three year old um granddaughter living in L.A. And her gift for this birthday was, uh, I think it was a Raptor, a Raptor Ford or the like, Ford Raptor, dude, but like the fucking the 2022 Ford Raptor or something like that. So he was just a a manager, and he had that kind of money. He has that yeah, kind of money, exactly. And and when how he, does he have that money still? How is he doing it from prison? I think I mean, you don't need to be there for every deal, right? You just need to have the contacts and the sources and keep everybody at play and playing their role, you know. Go kill that guy. Go do this. Go do that. And he's doing that? And he, he, he used to do that. Right now, he's not able to even talk right. to anyone. He only has uh, three calls a month and to vetted people, right? So it's basically his granddaughter, one of his uh, daughters also, uh, and his mom. And he wow. can only speak 15, he has only 15 minutes a month to speak to whichever, those three person he can talk to. And his lawyers, his, uh, his attorneys. I had a, an exclusive interview with his main attorney posted on my Instagram as well last week where she, she tells a lot of details about how El Chapo is really, you know. She says he's funny, he has good sense of humor, he's very respectful, uh, and that he knows that if the U.S. wants to stop the cartels, you'll have to go against politicians. And so that's an interesting thing. Against what politicians? Against U the U.S. politicians? And Mexico, both. U.S. and Mexican politicians. They're like, that's, that's, that's how you stop the cartel. And I'm like, wow, that's a fucking interesting... Have you ever met El Chapo? Never met, but I, I, I saw him uh, on his last, uh, last arrest before being extradited. He was arrested in Mexico City. And he was presented to to the press from the uh, Mexico hangar, you know, from the from the military base where he was being held before mm. being transported to Ciudad Juarez. Actually, I try to go into the prison in Ciudad Juarez um, to try and see if I could, could speak to someone, uh, but now he was like completely on the shoe, you know, like he yeah. was not able to. He was not able. Even, I mean, the guys who deliver food for him were. Um, they, they couldn't even look him in the eye. They had to be looking somewhere else and then give him the food. It's so crazy how, at least from my perspective, <laughs> it seems like the media has portrayed him as like the kingpin bot, like the, the number one jefe mm -hmm. of the Sinaloa cartel. Yeah, it's also a purpose, man. It's, 
when you when you work in the news, and I'm telling you because I work in the fucking news, it's super difficult to tell a story right because you will need to write so many words and enter in so many details that your articles will have to be extra fucking long and complicated articles explaining how everything works, mm. right? So the easiest way is, uh, let's just say El Chapo, right? I mean, he's sort of like the manager and the head and everybody says he's the head. So just <coughs> put El Chapo because people knows his name. People knows who we're talking about. It serves a purpose, so especially as, uh, for, uh, especially like getting clicks and views and clickbait type yeah, shit. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You're talking about El Chapo, people are going to click yeah, on it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I've, I've written stories, obviously, trying to set um, things straight and say, like, okay, he was just a fucking manager. Because how comes if he was responsible for all this shit, he's in jail. He's not even to speak to anyone right now. How comes his family keeps getting a lot of fucking money? How comes the, the, um, organi his organization, the Sinaloa Cartel, has never shipped so many cocaine than when he was in jail, right? The, the They're cocaine shipping more, more since he's been in prison? Exactly, more. Yeah. So it's like, the. I mean, it's obviously obviously not working, right? That kingpin strategy is not fucking working. It's just a waste of the taxpayers' money. How much money are they spe are they uh, are they they're, they're spending on keeping El Chapo locked, on paying uh, agents to go into Mexico to try to capture a kingpin, <coughs> to put him behind jail, behind bars, to transport him, extradite him, and all that shit. Um, and at the end. It doesn't really makes nothing on the on the real business, right? On the on the coke trade, on the mm -hmm. drug trade. Why don't we? Obviously, if America wanted to, they could completely take out the cartels. Yeah. But how would they do that? I think first of all, we'll have to. You have to go after the money and not after the guys, right? If you stop the flow on money, however it is, you know, like by frozen, uh, freezing their their accounts, seizing. Um, bank accounts because we're talking about these guys are laundering money in u.s companies they're laundering money through u.s banks through u.s uh, established companies so you have to go after all of, all of that, that fucking shit i mean the remittances that go to mexico and mexico is super proud of that saying like wow the or people in the u.s or hard-working people has never sent more money to their families in mexico the eighty percent of the, those fucking remittances, remittances are going well, to of the what of the remittances. Remittances. Mm -hmm. It's it's the money the uh, immigrant an immigrant um, in the U.S. working sends back to his family okay. through, um, you know, like through MoneyGram and all that stuff. All this all this mm -hmm. kind of uh, right. stuff. And they say it's to support their families in Mexico, right? right? That's where they're working here. Uh, but the reality is, most of that money is going to smugglers to keep their business going and keep their family uh trying to bring their family into the u.s but that money ends up in in the in in, in the smuggler's pocket and that's a reality and 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 people don't grasp it because when they say like oh so they're not so poor because if they're paying eight fucking grand to get across the border illegally i mean you can establish uh a business in mexico with eight grand easily right a small right. restaurant right. something like that but it's not the money of the people in Mexico, that's money from the people working in the U.S. And that's basically payment for smugglers. That's not remittances. That's that's payment for for bringing illegally people into the U.S. So, I mean, this world this world works like that. It's all on our noses, working under, you know, like established companies, established money being sent into Mexico. But behind that, it's a whole fucking criminal world operating right in front of us. Yeah. So there, these cartels are also making money by trafficking people across the border? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've never made more money out of that than, than what they're doing right now after the pandemic. Really? And they're um, charging eight grand a person? Yes, on the, on, on the, on the, on the best case scenario. Um, this guy who works, uh, I was telling you, in Sonora, a border state, <coughs> in Arizona, uh, was telling me they're rising, raising their uh, rates to 15 grand per person. They're making shit tons of money, man. Imagine a trailer like what we saw in San Antonio, full of, uh, I don't know, 60 migrants, and each one paying at least 10 grand, 8 grand. That's a shit ton of money. 
Yeah. Right? That's fucking wild, man. Yeah. I yeah. had no idea that that was going on. Yeah, man. I mean, for cartels, we have to understand that everything that it's illegal, they're going to bank on that. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're gonna bank on any everything that you make illegal, right? Or everything that has a good fucking uh, profit. Uh, I'm talking about avocado from Michoacan. They're banking a lot of fucking avocado. money from avocados. They're banking on, on everything they can, on everything they can right now. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that uh, that Roger Reese was also telling me was that uh, George Ochoa, he was like, yeah, he's like, I know exactly where he lives. I know where his house is. I can fly you there right now. He's like, he's sitting there probably drinking a glass of whiskey, smoking a cigar. Yeah. He's like, he has a horse ranch. I was like, how the fuck is he doing? Like, how does he? Yeah. This guy is completely immune to everything after everything he's done, all the people that he's killed. Yeah. Like, he's completely just living free, mm -hmm. riding his horses. Yeah, 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 in Mexico, that's that's what uh, what struck me also about the sons of, of El Mayo, right? When I learned that one of his sons was free to go back and forth from the U.S. and Mexico, I I called his lawyer. No, <coughs> for the, his lawyer called me first because he was he to, he called me to tell me that his client was sort of like angry at me about an article I published where I had the name of his client, the son of El Mayo. Because um, I said that he was still working with the organization of his of his dad. Uh, and the lawyer he, called you, and the lawyer called me, a U.S. based lawyer, and he called me and told me that his client was not happy about my story, and that I should uh, leave that part out of my story or change it. And I'm like, dude, I'm I'm backing up my sources. They're pretty strong sources um, inside the Sinaloa organization, and they know for a fact that your client is still. Um, taking decisions for the organization and he's like my client is a family man he's working um legally uh, on a corn farm in mexico in, in sonora in caborca and you know caborca is like one of the hottest places in, in mexico for the family really? hotel and i'm like is he able to go back and forth then and he's like no he's established his life in the u.s but then like two or three weeks later he got involved into an accident where his wife died in Caborca. And I'm like, I mean, he wasn't really supposed to be in Mexico? And he's like, no comment. And I'm like, so he's, he's able to go back and forth because he got into an accident in Mexico, in Caborca. Mm -hmm. But why would you, oh, fuck man, I can't imagine if, if El, one of El Mayo's kids, lawyers, called me and said, don't publish this shit. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie, I would be hesitant to publish it. I mean, it was already published, and okay. second of all, I, I told him, like, alright, so if you have something to say, I can't publish your version and what you say as a lawyer. And he's like, right. no, don't quote me. And then I'm like, okay, so then tell your client that he can openly talk to me record, yeah. and go on, on record, and I can definitely write a whole story about his version of, of things. And he's like, no, he's not talking. And I'm like, well, so what am I supposed to do? And then he basically hung up the phone and then sent me a text message uh, with a paragraph and said, like, this is what you should write. And I'm like, well, this is not how it works, right? I'm, I need to quote what you're telling me. I need to uh, uh, make it, like, attributable to someone. Right. I can't just say that because you're asking me to, mm. right? So my phone is open, you know where to find me, and if you want to go on the record or tell me who am I going to attribute this quote to, um, mm -hmm. by all means. And he never answered back. So explain the story how you got kidnapped. I was, uh, I was st basically starting to write, right? Uh -huh. um, I started working on a local newspaper in Ciudad Juarez by... Not by chance, because I was already looking, but I was too young. I was I was in my first year of college, and I went into this local newspaper, the main local newspaper in Ciudad Juarez, which is called El Diario de Juarez, and I went basically to apply for a job to to um, be a delivery boy, right? Okay. So I'm like, eh, I can work during the night delivering the paper, being the <laughs> first one to read it, and actually just you know like sneaking to the uh, newsroom to start finding how this shit works and figure out if I really want to be a journalist or not. Okay. So I went there, and the editor of the paper got confused, and he thought I was there applying for a copy editor position. <laughs> so he, um, he came down from the stairs and told me, oh, you're here for that copy editor uh, position, right? And I'm like, yes, come on up. And he showed me around. He put me in front of a computer and said, like, okay, so that's uh, your first, your first um, job, right? 
and I had no clue on what the fuck to do, you know. So I asked around, like, what should I do? How do I turn on this fucking machine and everything? Um, of course, after, I don't know, maybe three months, they they, they learned that, that, that I faked my position. But I was already in and I was already working and doing some good jobs. So we we're like, ah, fuck it, man. We're going we're gonna to give you the job in, on, on the longer term. Uh, so I started very young without, uh, without actually college education, right? So I started like working, learning while I was working and going to college. That's incredible. And it was pretty cool to me. How old are you now? <clears throat> I'm 35. Okay. And so that was pretty cool to me. But at the same time, it, I, I, have, I, I didn't have the uh, proper tools, right? Um, and not to say they, um, we have never seen anything like that fucking war on drugs in Mexico before. That was the first time in, 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 in the whole country that we started seeing people honking from the breaches. Um, that, um, that amount of murders in the city, talking about a fight between cartels that ruthless, talking about, um, you know, like bazookas in the middle of a fucking gunfight, you know, like grenades. So it was full on war. We didn't know what to do. Not even like experienced journalists had experienced that before. So I was in the, in the battleground learning at school at a newspaper and at the same time in the streets of the fucking epicenter of a drug war. Um, so in the middle of all of that, I started like publishing some investigations like how cartels were recruiting people over Metroflog back then before MySpace and before Facebook. What was it called? It, it was called Metroflog. Okay. And it was huge in Mexico. It was like a social network. And they started recruiting people, young, young sicarios um, over <coughs> Metroflog, right? Mm -hmm. And I published that and that gave, uh, again, a lot of attention for that story uh, from, from everywhere, from other journalists, but also from sources uh, in, the, in the cartel, but also in, in law enforcement. So I had this guy who told me that he was an informant for the DEA and that he had a lot of information about what's going on in Mexico. And we kept um, writing uh, back and forth for at least, uh, at least a year before I actually met him in, in Ciudad Juarez. And he... He gave me these papers with a lot of phone numbers and, and audio files from a woman working for the local police in Ciudad Juarez. <coughs> she was a police officer, uh, but she was uh, literally fuck, fucking um, a, a military commandante, um, federal police commander as well, and a local police chief. So she was in bed with the three of them and an article. So she was sharing information all over. You know, like she was uh, getting paid by all over those guys but to share information about each other. You know, So she was like in the middle of, of everything. Uh, he gave me her name, her phone number, uh, a lot of uh, recordings he had on, on her and how she was operating. And of course, I pulled the fucking story, right? She, this is a local police woman in bed with all these people sharing information on one of the calls that I got, I got <coughs> to listen how she's dealing information between each other. She said this and that. Blah, blah, blah. So I, I had the whole fucking story. It went to, um, to the, um, to the um, cover of the, of the newspaper on both sides in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. So it was a huge story. I was super happy because I was like, wow, wow, my, finally my stories are making the, the front page, right? Um, and that was that my editor told me, are you sure you want to, you want to have your byline, uh, your name on the byline? We can, we can have a different name or, a, or, a, you know, like a nickname or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, of course I need my name, man. It's a huge fucking investigation. <laughs> and, and that was my mistake after, I don't know, two or three nights, I, w I left my girlfriend at the time at, at her house, was driving back to my, to my parents' house. And um, two police officers on different uh, pickup trucks, they stopped me in the middle of the night. They started um, uh, hitting my, my window with their guns, like, get, get the fuck out of the car. And I was pretty sure that they were taking me by mistake, right? I was mm. like, they're looking for someone else. It's a fucking mess in the city. And I'm the only dude that it's out one in the morning in the streets. But I had my, my um, newspaper badge and everything. So I went down from my car they started like kicking me and pushing me around i was like hey dude i i think you're mistaken it's like no we're not mistaken man you know what you did they kept kicking me and, and and beating me and i never i never understood like until that point i was like 
why are they that these guys are just fucking confusing i mean i have what did i do and they're like you know what you did after a while of that they took my uh my car keys some one of those guys jumped into my car and started driving and they tied my my hands and my ankles and put me in the back of a pickup truck and they put their foot on top of my on the back of your pickup truck no on, a different on, one on their pickup on the on the official police pickup truck right uh and they put their feet on my back um so th so i will stay down while they were driving um they started driving for about i don't know like 20 25 minutes and then i felt they went like uh into a dirt road and i was like fuck man i'm i'm fucked and they stopped they untie me and one of those guys uh told me like the commander told me i'm gonna give you a chance to run uh so start fucking running and i immediately knew that he was gonna fucking shoot me in the back if i started running and said right. like he got me there by mistake or that i had a gun on me or some shit like that so i was like i'm not i'm not gonna run man it's like are you stupid or what i'm gonna i'm giving you a fucking chance to run and you're not taking it and i'm like no nah, man i know what these what's guys going were straight on. up planning on executing yeah you. yeah totally because he told me he told me like they're gonna find you um he used this word uh he told me they will find you in the back of your car as a cattle as dead cattle all right Como una vaca muerta. that's that's what he told me um uh so they they were up to me like they were really trying to kill me and i remember that i got in my knees and i don't remember being uh, yelling or screaming but the commander told me stop fucking yelling and i'm like i'm not yelling i'm just asking you for a favor and it's like you're not in no position of asking a favor and he started like uh, beating me again with this fucking gun and i'm like i'm not i'm not yelling i'm just asking you for 10 minutes 10 minutes l l give me a number and i can have the money uh someone uh, to, to bring the money here and just give me 10 minutes how much money will, will 10 minutes cost me and he's like it's not like that man you fucked up with the wrong person so you're fucked and then another guy stepped in and said like what if we and then they just used code numbers right that i sort of like understood that they were talking about that deal that if what if we get money and let him go for a few minutes and then we go after him and then we fucking kill him and get the killed and the money right because i remember i think it was 25 on the on the radio thing they had they used to have radios right like two-way uh radio communications to talk between the police uh and i think 25 was referring to a male uh death to a deceased male and 24 was deceased woman and okay. stuff like that so i remember that he said something like what if we 19 first and then we 25 him uh and i was like shit they're planning something and then they're gonna kill me right, right, right so i was like that's my chance and i'm like yeah 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 i mean just let me know keep my fucking car let me know how much money you need and just give me 10 fucking minutes because i knew i'm a dual set i'm a dual citizen right? right so i was like i'm gonna fucking run to the u.s to el paso and stay there forever and fuck them right um and then they started like fighting between each other uh and then the commander said like all right uh you know what bring me uh, i had two cards at the time a mexican debit card and a u.s debit card where mm -hmm. i was paid by the news organization i worked with um <coughs> but the limit uh to the, to um withdraw from the atm was uh six uh, grand pesos which is like around 300 bucks on each card so i bring back 600 bucks and I was like, that's the limit that I could get from the ATM. I was walking. So they let you leave? They let me leave. And I remember, By yourself? Yeah. And I, I'm walking, though, because they kept my wallet and they kept my car. Um, and I remember when I started walking, I was like, hey, just give me your man's word that you're not going to shoot me on the, the back while I walk out. And he's like, you, you, don't, you can't ask me for a man's word, man. Uh, but he's like but you give me yours you're not gonna fucking run because we're gonna find you and your family we have your ids and everything and i'm like dude i'm not trying to run and he's like all right so i started walking instead of running because in my head i was like if they shoot me it's gonna look different and my my colleagues at the newspapers they're gonna investigate mm -hmm. and they're gonna know that i was not running that mm -hmm. i was actually walking and someone shot me in the back because mm -hmm. i was fucking sure that they, that that was they were gonna fucking shoot me in the back so I started walking down this dark alley, uh, went up to an ATM, 
down the street, down one of the main streets, uh, took money from both of my cards and then came back and gave him the money and told, told him like, just uh, count the, the money. And it's like, now there's no need. Uh, there you go. That's your car. Make sure you're not missing anything from your car. That's your wallet. Make sure you're not missing anything from your wallet. And we'll see you in 10 minutes. And I'm like, all right. And I started fucking driving like crazy. By then it was like maybe three in the morning. They'll see you in 10 minutes. They were gonna, they were gonna find me. They were gonna look for me again for, for, from the IDs that I had and from, you know, everything they gather on me. But the thing is I had an, um, I haven't updated my ID from, from Mexico. So I had an old fucking address on my Mexican ID, not the, the address where I was living with my parents. Right. And that address was, I mean, when I, when I, where I was living with my parents was a gated community, mm -hmm. super fucking protected, where most of the owners of Ciudad Juarez live, right? Like the, mm -hmm. the main uh, business owners, lawyers, doctors, all that stuff. They right. live there. So it's very fucking protected. It's, it's impossible that they would go in right. without getting into a trouble. So, yeah, that's, that's how I left. I, I went home. I, I remember one thing. I had two phones on me. I had my personal phone and the phone from, from the newspaper, right? And they asked me to turn off the phones. So when I was turning off, I turned off the work phone. And when I was about to turn off my personal phone, my girlfriend called me to see if everything was good. And instead of turning off the phone, I answered. So she started listening everything. And she called my parents. And she, both of them were listening when these guys told me that they were going to find me dead on the back of my car, that they were going to kill me. Uh, when they started beating me, all that shit. So when I got home, my parents were fucking hysterical. Oh my God. They were God. like, what the fuck is going on? My dad was fucking crazy. And I was like, I just need to, need, need, need to go, I need to go, I need to go. And I packed a fucking backpack, you know, with clothes. I remember I only packed... Um, I only packed uh, jeans and no fucking shirts because <laughs> I was not thinking straight. Oh, what right. did you do? Straight to El Paso? And I went straight to El Paso to, to a hotel and then I started renting a department in El Paso and I remember it was fucking dark times because I was, I was crying almost every fucking night because I was looking at my city and looking at the, you know, I was like, I, I want to go back. That's my fucking city, man. That's where I, I want to leave and I lived in an apartment that was it's <coughs> like in a small hill and I will look over to Ciudad Juarez, to the whole fucking city, and just thinking about how many people were being killed and what happened to me in that traumatic event and all the shit and the fact that I couldn't just go there and the fact that I had to change my, my beat of writing from writing from security and investigation to fucking sports and cultural shit in El Paso. Mm. It was just too much. And I remember I, I, I used to drink a lot and cry a lot like every fucking night, you know, because I, I was feeling so fucking bad about that. Uh, and then like nine months later, a uh, source of mine, a guy who I went to in, in middle school, he, uh, <coughs> he, he started working later, eventually, he started working with a Korean organization in Juarez, right? He started like growing up because his dad used to be a Nautico and then he started like playing the same mm -hmm. path. Uh, and he called me and he told me, he asked me like, hey, what happened to you? And I'm like, nothing and he's like what are you and i'm like i might i might work at el diario and he's like and what happened and i'm like what do you mean because I, I didn't tell anyone like anyone i didn't no. i didn't want anyone to fucking know what happened to me because i was so fucking scared for mm -hmm. my family that was still living in mm -hmm. Juarez. um i did a report to human rights um to leave it as background for it so something happened to me i had a file on human rights um on the international commission of human rights and that was fucking it and um and and he told me no i know that something happened and i'm like no man he's like well i don't know why why, why are you not trusting me if i always have always tr trust you with my sources and my information and now you're not trusting me i know something happened to you anyways you have your reason not to tell me but if you want to turn on the tv tonight i'm gonna leave you a, a present to make you feel better <laughs> and i'm like ah, whatever turn on the news that it was i think it was like at 9 p.m and in the same spot where these uh, first two pickup trucks stopped me before taking me, that in that same place, those both pickup trucks were shot dead. They killed the fucking police officers. In the, and I, I'm pretty sure it was the same police officers that stopped me that night. So I think it was him. I think it was my contact who actually got them killed, got the police killed and shit. 
and what? I call him back and I was, so he knew about all this he knew about <clears throat> you so that means he must have known about you getting kidnapped and you mm -hmm. the plan for you to get executed yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I asked him crying angry <clears throat> and told him that to never call me again I was like dude I don't want to carry those fucking buddies with me you know like the, that's not my fault I'm a fucking journalist I'm, an, I'm not a fucking murderer I never asked you for anything you fucked up that's on you that's on your hands not on mine and he was like aren't you happy you can actually go back to Juarez now and feel safe and I'm like dude it's not how it works man I'm not in that world stop calling me um, I'm telling you from today on we're not friends we're I don't know you man bye and I stopped communicating with him up, up until today I never have a word again with him this is a guy that you've known since <coughs> since uh, since kids. He, he since used to be my neighbor, and then we wow. went to school together and all that shit. Uh, so it was a very mixed feeling, right? Because at the same time, I was like, "That's that's not who I am." But at the same time, I was like, "Wow, does that mean that I can go back to my city and feel safe again?" Right. And I started going uh, day by day and feeling more comfortable and more comfortable. And then I I, went, I moved back into Juarez. I, I, I fucking love living in Juarez, man. <laughs> really? Honest, what is it about place. Juarez that's that, that's so much better? What do you love about it? I don't know, man. I don't know. I mean, of course, I have family now, uh, so that's why we have a house in, in El Paso, but we rent a apartment in, in Juarez. Um, but and of course, my family stays uh, the longest time in El Paso. And we don't really spend much time in Juarez, but every time I can, I. <clears throat> I I, go, I, st I stay there. I stay there. I just fucking love the vibe to the city. It's a, it's it's a, it's a dangerous animal, you know. Like so, and I, and I like that about Juarez. I mean, is it like the adri is it you get like an yeah, adrenaline rush it, being I guess there? It, I guess it's the mix of. Uh, I guess it's the mix of. I compare it to like imagine you you are the owner of a super fucking dangerous lion. Mm. And it's a lion, and it can kill you anytime. But you've known him for fucking ever, and you know he's not gonna kill you. So you go in the jail and you enjoy, you know, like playing with the fucking killing animal that you know he's not gonna kill you, but he might, you know. And it's and you know him so fucking well. Have you ever heard of that theory? People have. T I've heard it talked a, a, a many times before, where people talk about <coughs> that there's supposedly a set time and place where everybody's gonna die. Yeah. Have you heard? Of that? Have you yeah. heard that talked about before? And it's like a peep. They they try to attribute it to people who are just like do crazy daredevil stunts, like the, that mm -hmm. guy Alex Holland who who climbs the mountains with no yeah. no gear or anything. <clears throat> he just has a bag of chalk in his hands and he climbs these giant like hundred foot cliffs. Yeah. And they like they try to figure out why these people just do these incredibly death defying feats with all the time. And they're still alive, and they, they seem to have no fear of it. Like, how do you not? How are you not afraid of dying? No, I am. I'm, the thing is, that's that's what I get a lot of wrong from people. They they always assume that I'm not afraid. That I, you know, like that mm. I that I'm not afraid when I go into these places where all that shit. But I am. I am. I am afraid, and I've, I've been afraid most of my fucking life. And and I am afraid every time I have to go in bed. And I have. I'm afraid of everything. Every time I get a call, all this shit. But you were born in it, so you understand but, it better than ninety nine point nine percent of people. I guess I guess I'm more curious than afraid. You know, I'm I'm cur I mean, when the lawyer of El Mayo son called me, I knew that something because I was I was like, this is an Arizona um, area code phone number. Not not good news are coming from this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. And so I had I had a choice. I had like I can either don't answer the call or answer the call. If I answer the call, I'm gonna engage in a conversation that I might not wanna hear. You know that I mm -hmm. might be better well off. Um, but at the same time, it's like fuck it. I mean, I'm so curious to know who it is and why. Um, the call I just got before getting here. That guy talking about, and I know his number, and I have him register on their codes as most of those sources and i know he, who he was and, I, and my phone started ringing and i'm like oh i'm about to leave i'm about to request my uber drive to to here mm -hmm. but i'm like 
fuck it, let's see what he wants. And because I'm more curious about that, you know. Don't you? Do you feel like that you are these guys? Like you are the same, you like you and these guys that are in these that are working in the cartels, whether no matter what level they might be at. Do you feel like that you guys are like the same? It's just that you kind of you took one different <coughs> turn at one point, but you guys are still like everything about you is the same. Like you could easily have been him. He could have easily been you. Yeah. M more than that, I feel like I'm the same as every other fucking <laughs> human in, in the world. And that's, I think that's, it's true. That's my advantage, right? Like we are all a grayscale. There is mm -hmm. no bad guy right. that is fully bad. There's no good guy that is fully good. When you see someone that is portrayed as complete, a hundred percent bad person. There's something wrong about that. It's like there's something off. There's something that it's not right, and it's not completely true. The same as the same as if you feel that one guy is so fucking good and he's a hundred percent a good person. There's there has to be something super fucking off on that dude, you know? Yeah. Because where that doesn't exist, man. And I'm and I know that for a fucking fact. There is no black or white. It, right. We are all a fucking grayscale. Some of us are a little bit more on 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 the on the darker side of that grayscale. Some of us more on the wider, uh, wider, um, you know, like scale. But we are, and, and that's how I feel about everyone, uh, uh, every single fucking human. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's, I guess they you see the humanity in these people yeah. that no one else does. And I think they perceive that that I treat them yeah. as I will treat everybody fucking else, a president, um, U.S. soldier my friend you know like they're not my friend so i don't talk to them like hey amigo you know right. i talk to them like with respect respecting that they're a fucking human and that i'm not especially afraid of them for any particular reason that's what they do for fucking living they're adults that's mm -hmm. their that's what they chose and i have nothing to do with that right i'm not pushing them mm -hmm. or asking them out of that i'm just taking them for what they are it's like okay that was your fucking choice i'm not judging and by showing fear, you're judging someone, right? You're judging that you're dangerous, mm -hmm. you're violent, you are a bad guy, and I'm the good guy because I'm the one afraid of you. And by not having or showing the fear you have, it's like equals. It's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can be bad too, man, and you can be good too, and whatever. I don't, I, I don't care about that. Let's let's talk business. Let's talk. What do you want to talk yeah. about? So, does that not frustrate the shit out of you when you see like the main news organizations, especially on TV, talk about everything? Because they they talk about everything in black and white. That's yeah. that's the the narrative. You got to paint it one. This news organization paints it black. This news organization paints it white. Yeah, and they all try to just like like generalize everything. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's frustrating because I'm part of that shit. You know, like I'm I, I right. Work that's for what, that's news. what I'm saying. Yeah. It must be so frustrating. I, I I work for news outlets, and every time I pitch something, it's not interesting. And every time I know that I'm gonna pitch something <coughs> that it's interesting, it's because it's oversimplistic, right? I mean, I got used to it. I'm used to it, and that's why I'm uh, being more active and on my social accounts, on like my Instagram account, to to talk about how I really feel about issues, how how I re how am I really finding these particular issues or people or, st or stuff, right? Because, I mean, one thing is to put up a news where you say, El Chapo was the biggest trafficker in the world, whatever. But when I go in my Instagram or my Twitter, <coughs> I go and say, like, well, he's not really the boss, and try I try to explain what's behind that news, right? And mm. I try to, to have a... I don't know, like live streams every month at least where I talk about that and and I talk about like their latest news and try to go more in depth about about all that stuff. Um, that's why I guess I I, I come uh, to to shows like 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 yours, like the one uh, I, yeah. I was in the other channel, um, trying to to set the record straight, right? Because the the news are not the place to do that. I mean, they they are supposed to, but they're not. So does that does the process work where you're you're pitching stories to just like your contacts in the media? Like you have different relationships with different like publications, like Vice or mm -hmm. Business Insider, and you kind of come up with stories. Or did they ever reach out to you and ask you to do do reporting? Both. I guess at the beginning it was more of me pitching a lot. Okay. I used to I used to um, had a. <coughs> 
uh, like a record of pitching and I was like okay how many stories did I, I pitched on this week and I was pitching about 200 stories a month so I was like pitching a wow. shit fucking and, 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 and getting 10% of those approved how the fuck do you find 200 stories to pitch there's a lot of fucking stories all over Latin America happening at the same time and so and it's, it's just a matter of being aware and how you look that same news that everybody's reporting on and finding a new angle you know and as a freelancer you have to be way better than their staffers not better in the sense of better journalists, but with a with a different perspective than their staffers. Something their staffers are not uh, tapping, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise, they will go like, nah, my, I'm already having this guy on a payroll, so I'm going to go with his story. So you have to bring something new, something different about that story. And it's about how you look at the world. And I think I've always had that look into the world in a different manner that most of the people and it's just a matter of how i see it and how i perceive stories and how i perceive the world and so i used to pitch like a shit ton of fucking stories of, of course some of the editors were fed up with my <laughs> pitching they were like fuck man this is too many fucking stories really so i had to come up with different outlets right like okay i'm not gonna pitch 50 stories to business insider and 50 to buys and 50 you know i was like <clears> i'm gonna find 20 different news outlets and pitch everyone uh, a story that it's more catered to their needs, right? So I know that Vice has a certain style and certain, um, they, lo they like certain type of stories. Mm -hmm. Business Insider is different. Um, the Daily Beast is different. CBS is different. New um, TV, like uh, Netflix shows and everything like that, it's different. So, mm -hmm. so I started like catering for everyone and I'm a fucking workaholic. So I'm working almost 20 hours a day and... And Do they ever like fuck with your stories at all? Like the editors, like try to get you to change stuff yeah, and make a, it a lot. like sway it, like make it weird. A lot, and I used to, and I somewhere along the way I lost my 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 willing to push the <laughs> to the right story. So you mean I'll, willing to push back against to push them. back against against some shit? Uh, but very recently, I recovered that that will that will you know to push back and and say like, hey, I'm not liking that. I'm I'm not happy with these or not happy with with that or the way you're saying this because it's not necessarily true, you know. Mm -hmm. You have Substack, right? Yeah, yeah, I have a Substack account where I post most of the stuff that goes out from my editors, right? Mm -hmm. Like that interview with a uh, Chaps attorney. Um, with who? With El Chapo's attorney. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Um, I think the main thing was to paint a different picture about El Chapo, about Emma's coronel, Emma Coronel, his wife, and about how the attorney ended up being the attorney of the fucking most notorious drug cartel uh, boss, you know, and and about how he felt that the U.S. needs to go against politicians on both sides of the of the wall, of the border. Uh, but when I pitched that didn't didn't ring the editors the editors needed something more s simplistic right they wanted to talk about the uh the role of women in the narco world and if i could speak to the attorney about that the role of women of in, the, women narco in world? the narco world like how they were are how women are stepping in more and more getting more involved in better places better places well more uh, more okay. up high up above in, in the organization which is pretty cool but to me, it was like a waste of time talking about that with El Chapo Satorni, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean. They wanted to fit. Yeah. They, they, wanted, they yeah. wanted to fit into mm -hmm. certain things mm -hmm. that they think work for yeah. them. And I think it's, it's cool. I mean, it's, 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 uh, that's, their, that's their job. And my, most of my editors are really respectable people and really respectable journalists. But, but at the same time, that some, like, some, some stories are not their feet, right? And mm -hmm. instead of like sending them in straight to the trash bin, I started a, sub, a Substack account where, where I post most of those stories that don't really make it mm -hmm. or didn't make it like the way I was receiving that news and maybe going yeah. raw, you know, like putting... Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's that's the goal, right? Is to be a completely independent publishing mm -hmm. your own shit. I mean, because if I can think about any of the most any of the most notable journalists or reporters that, that I actually think are interesting or pay attention to, they're completely independent. They're yeah. not staffers yeah. for fucking Business Insider yeah. or, or some exactly. or Vice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? These guys are completely doing their own thing. They're rogue yeah. in, yeah. A, in a sense, exactly. you know? Which is fucking hard on... On the financial side of it, you know, yeah. you need to fucking work a lot to make mm -hmm. a decent living out of that. And and the thing is, um, the the whole the whole thing about how payments go because they pay you 
uh, 30 days later after publication and you have to submit an invoice and pay your own taxes and sometimes they're late on you're talking about Substack you're talking about like the uh, publications uh, publications oh yeah, yeah yeah so yeah so it's you have to be a, a, a fucking mastermind of the accounting you know <laughs> to have your accountings on check and mm -hmm. and not face money gaps you know so at the beginning right. when I started freelancing like 10 years ago uh, I I faced a lot of fucking money gaps where I did I, my my money flow was not well organized and sometimes I was like what the fuck I have zero fucking money for the whole month mm -hmm. that's fucking crazy and and then mm -hmm. I started like working on that right M working on on setting better prices for my stories saying no to publications that want a low volume um, and being more smart about invoicing and mm -hmm. you know like having a, a fucking whole thing organized when this is the the day that i shall invoice because i'm getting paid up until the next month right right so i need to pull more, more stories to the next month to make up for that so it's it's a hard thing to balance when you just want to yeah. like go do the fun shit like yeah i just it, want to be creative and, and exactly, do cool exactly. shit i don't want to fucking worry about totally because you're i mean you're tied up enough with talking with these people trying to set up interviews right. traveling on your own money all this shit right and then after that, you're still going to have to go to all of your financial stuff, you know, like getting mm -hmm. paid and the invoices, paying your taxes, <coughs> all that shit. So it's, 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 it's a it's lot a of grind, fucking work. Man. Yeah, man. So it's a lot of fucking work. <laughs> yes. Um, when did fentanyl become, first come on the scene in Mexico? I mean, I know it's been going on for a, since at <coughs> least 10, since 2015, mm -hmm, but yeah. over the last two years, especially, I yeah. feel like the fentanyl thing that with the opioid and the overdoses with fentanyl have been just skyrocketing. Yeah. The thing is, the crazy fucking thing is, uh, fentanyl, it's a story in the U.S., but it's not a story in Mexico because fentanyl is not staying in Me Mexico. No one is doing fentanyl in Mexico. No one is consuming fentanyl in Mexico. If you go to any city like Ciudad Juarez or Culiacán or Monterrey or whichever city you go, Cancun or whatever, and try to get a pill, of an, pff, you're, you're not going to get anything. Can't find it? Not even in Monterrey? Yeah, no. Dude, it's funny story about Monterrey. I have a bunch <coughs> of Mexican friends, and uh, they taught me. I used to know Spanish like very well. Uh -huh. Like I could speak it. I could hold a conversation. No way. Like somewhat, at least. And uh, I would try to convince, like, I had, I'd bet my my buddies, be like, I bet you I could convince him I'm Mexican. <laughs> and I would, he would just, I'd be like, I, I would like get little tips, like, how can I convince this dude I'm Mexican? He goes, just say soy de Monterrey. All the white Mexicans <laughs> yeah, are from Monterrey. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. You could easily play that out. <laughs> so That's it. funny. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's impossible to get pills because this the same criminal organizations have have it uh, prohibited, right? Mm -hmm. You can't sell fentanyl in Mexico to Mexicans. That's all for export. Um, well, the fentanyl in the <coughs> U.S. is like hidden, though, right? Like, it's not you're not actually buying fentanyl. People who are d dying are b trying to buy other shit that's cut with fentanyl. Yes, exactly. But th there's two ways fentanyl is getting into the U.S. Uh, one, it's pure fentanyl, where they where they ship pure fentanyl, so people in the U.S. can cut their own shit. They're with manufacturing fentanyl. here. Right? Uh huh. <coughs> uh, well, no, they're, they're manufacturing in. Well, they're getting it from China. Well, they're manufacturing like the pills and shit. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and they're uh -huh. and the other is the actual pills or heroin or coke. Uh, laced with fentanyl and shipped into the U.S. Here's one thing I don't fucking get. How is, there's no way people are intentionally cutting coke with fentanyl. I don't think so. Because it's the complete polar opposite drug. If, you're, if you want to keep selling your coke mm -hmm. and you're giving people coke with fentanyl, I mean, you're not going to keep your clients for very so, long. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, at some point, I was convinced that that was a myth that coke mixed with fentanyl because I, I found no proof. But then I found proof in the U.S. of, of U.S. law enforcement who started sending me um, results from uh, analysis, uh, drug tests where coke was being mixed with fentanyl but i think and i'm guessing that has to be unintentional uh, yeah exactly i read an article and i, I saw I, I a guy was <coughs> basically i guess he was just going around doing coke in different cities and mm -hmm. or asking coke or testing coke from different cities mm -hmm. and i think what the analysis was is the people who are buying like shit from the street like mm -hmm. the shitty stuff from like low level drug dealers who are selling you have low level drug dealers who are selling cheap shit to poor people and these guys are selling coke mm -hmm. and heroin mm -hmm. to the same people and yeah. they're cutting it on the same fucking table okay. <laughs> so they're accidentally getting a little bit of fentanyl in the coke <clears throat> yeah. but the people who are like the rich people who are buying it from high level people who don't mix the, these guys aren't selling heroin mm -hmm. they're just selling coke so, they're not going to get it cut with heroin. exactly that's that's exactly what i think it's happening because there's no i mean it wouldn't really make sense to, to cut 
your coke with Fent, right? Right. But I mean, on on my own experience, I've never found someone who was actually telling me like we're cutting coke with fentanyl. I have never. And then there's these craziest stories about weed laced with fentanyl. Weed laced with fentanyl, right? And it's like how and why, you know? It's I don't know, man. It's uh, it might ha be happening, but not that I'm aware of, you know. Not that right. I, I keep reading stories, but it's all, all, always from sketchy news outlets that they're putting out these super fucking uh you know like uh, so the people in the u.s that are dying the, the large majority of people who are dying from fentanyl what is it how is that happening are they intentionally taking fentanyl or, or is it just you know, the, what is it? the vast majority it's an intentional uh, overdose of taking some something that it's laced usually this fucking pale per uh, uh, fake perco the fake Percocet pills. Percocets? Mm -hmm. The fake blue pills. Yeah. Those, that shit. I, w I went into a laboratory in Sinaloa uh, of, of, of fake Percocets. And really? Dude, it's, I mean, it's it's crazy how, how that shit is, uh, how the they're manufacturing those pills in a s small fucking apartment. I, wa I was in one of those <coughs> biggest labs two years ago, I think, or three years ago uh, in Sinaloa as well. And the thing used to be very different. It was huge lab in the um in the outskirts of of Culiacan um so it was like outdoors lab you know like what you think with with huge fucking barrels of precursors and shit and they will do huge fucking batches of of uh, fentanyl laced um like paste that they will turn into pills press into pills later um but then apparently this year El Mayo order the whole fucking industry to make smaller uh, labs all over the city more labs but smaller the smaller quantities so if they will get busted they will just find a lab and they will lose that small huge amount. amount of exactly right so i went there last year um to one of these small new labs and i mean they don't even know what they're fucking getting right they just they just got a chinese man a chinese chemist straight from china to teach them how to fucking cook pills mixed fentanyl because uh, everything, all the precursors and fentanyl is coming straight from, from China to the Sinaloa cartel. So who's sending the Chinese <coughs> chemist? The Chinese, the Chinese triads, which pretty sure the fucking <laughs> government. Holy knows that. And There's who's paying this fucking chemist? The Sinaloa cartel. The cartel's paying the cartels, yeah. Both, both cartels, uh, Sinaloa and Cartel Jalisco are paying like the same um, group in China, right? And these Chinese chemists came, come here, well, come into Mexico, and they teach both uh, on different places and different uh, dates and everything, like by separately. But but it's the, f the same guys that are showing both how to do shit, you know? Whoa! Uh, and it's <laughs> it's crazy. So I went in into one of these labs, and um, is this one of the labs you went to? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly that's that's the lab I, I was. The lab I was, uh, I think, last year. Wow! And that's one of the um, <coughs> Sinaloa uh, chemists that was uh, recently, uh, you know, shown by shown by by this uh, Chinese chemist on how to cook those pills. So this was a Chinese guy? No, that was okay. a Mexican guy. Uh, but he learned straight from this Chinese guy, and he told me how. He told me how. Um, he basically said, like, say the, Ch the Chinese came here and he was like, I'm going to be here for three months and, and you're just going to watch how I do shit. Every single time I do a new batch, you're just going to watch. And after three months, I'm gonna, uh, you're <coughs> going you're gonna to be on test. You're going to make a test for me. Um, and if you're ready and if we ship that uh, shit to the U.S. and the shit sells and the customers are happy with it and everything, then you're ready to go. Otherwise, I'm going to have to stay here another three months and stuff. So that's how that guy learned how to how to make pills. Whoa! He's like, okay, at the three months he stopped, and he said, like, okay, you're flying solo. I started cooking. He just watched and watched and watched. I made a whole batch. We shipped it over, uh, and the shit was good. Uh, they have a test that I show on the on the video how they how they test the, the pills for quality, and apparently they they, they use a foil paper. Uh, aluminum paper and then they put the peel and they start burning the paper and if the peel slides that 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 means it's a good quality peel and if the peel gets stuck that means it's a sh shitty batch and you have to do all over again and now is this because the fentanyl is cheaper than what they used to use yeah man i mean what do they used to use just opium 
Yeah, they used to they used to do um, heroin basically, which heroin. is yeah, okay. uh-huh. but um, fentanyl. It's not that it's cheaper, <clears throat> but it's um, you have to use less of a quantity to right, to make less. it like super fucking you know um, strong. They have addicts in the city that they test pills uh, with as well. Like they give him a pill or two, and he, right. He, That's got to be a crazy thing when you're making a giant batch of those things. Like, yeah. did, if you could just put the, if you put a little bit too much fentanyl in there. Actually, one of the, one of his helpers, one of the helpers of these, of the, 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 look that the, he's uh he's Full testing it. that. He's testing the pill for quality. Oh, is this what he said when you when it slides? Pill score uh-huh. to make sure it slides. If you see the pill slide. If the pill will stock, that means that's not a good pill. Wow. But that was not the proper laboratory. Yeah. Later that night, so the that other guy on the on the oh, yellow. Oh, the echoing oh, again. So sorry. No, we're good. That that guy on the yellow uh, thing. Um, yeah. He was just out of the hospital because they fucked up over uh, a, a pack of fentanyl, of pure fentanyl. What they do is when when I was there. And when they were going to throw the fentanyl into the mix, they asked me to go as far as I could from them. And I was wearing a fucking mask, like a, you know, like a proper mask, not like, not like a, right. you know, like a face mask from COVID or whatever. It was like this gas mask I was like wearing. Like Breaking Bad. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they were like, can you get away as far as back as you can? Because it, and they closed windows, they sealed everything. Because they were like, if we pour the, the fentanyl, the, the potter, and... And you inhale some of this shit, you're fucking done. The guy in yellow was still shaking because he was just out of the hospital because he fucked up and he inhaled. Like basically, he threw too fast the potter. So the dust um, came up, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. it lifted some dust. He inhaled that. Seven days in coma. In, at the oh hospital. my God. And that dude. was the, ne- the day that he was just out. Uh, so he was like, when they put the fucking fentanyl into the mix they opened it like super slowly and they threw it like and he was like oh, like super fucking scared you know to God, put that shit bro. and then they started like mixing the whole shit and then pressing the pills the only thing that they didn't let me um record was the the pressing of the pills they were like super sketchy about the really? about the machine about the presser i was like that, that's in fucking amazon you know <laughs> it's super cheap and easy to find why it's like i don't know man my boss told me specifically you're not going to record the uh, the presser. You know? Really? All right. I mean, they allow me to record the whole fucking precursor, the whole th- fucking thing, the whole apps and everything. Uh-huh. But the presser. So what. all, but all of the actual like raw, like raw fentanyl, all of it, 100% comes from China. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All of it comes from China. Sometimes it, it comes from <coughs> um, Germany but coming from china so it went out from china stopped in in germany to some organization mm-hmm. in fan, in germany and that was shipped over to uh mexico coast called Montanillo. now has anyone ever tried to figure out who like who specifically in china they're getting it from i mean i'm getting a lot of uh a lot of uh uh stuff from there but most of them are saying triads and then they keep sending me names of the triads and stuff but then i i'm talking with a guy that he used to be like an i don't know if it's some something like an undercover working for some u.s sketchy organization in china he was recently blacklisted so he had to, he had to go out from china and he's living in taiwan right now because he was looking into that shit uh and he told me that it's the um the government the chinese government it's like it's a it's a um, Chinese um, Communist Party that it's uh, allowing these shipments. So is this like I guess the the big conspiracy conspiratorial <laughs> question is this like re- China trying to get revenge for the <coughs> opium war that happened between the British the British like sold tons of opium to China like mm-hmm. way 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 back yeah. in the day and like really fucked up China. Yeah. I don't know if it's I don't <coughs> know if it's revenge, but but honestly, it it looks like. It seems like a conspiracy theory, you know. Like when you when I when I talk about that, everybody is like, "Well, that sounds a, a little bit of a conspiracy theory, but also sort of like racist, right?" And I'm not trying to be either both. I'm trying to be very objective for what I've seen with my own eyes and report it with my own sources. And it well, is, if, if you were China, yeah, and 
wouldn't that wouldn't that be a great way to Kill attack of, your opponent? That's the only way they're fucking diminishing the power of the U.S. That's their only way in the U.S. Right? Mexico's having these um, this new or renewed um, diplomatic relationship with China, commercial relationship with China. China is opening more to Mexico financially and economically. We have more. Uh, diplomatic relationship with china than before with this new government mm -hmm. um china is uh sending diplomatic people to greet um governments like nicaragua that are openly socialist and blacklisted by the u.s venezuela so they're making their moves everywhere the u.s is fucking up right and that yeah. includes mexico the, the the relationship between the Mexico and the U.S. has never been at the lowest, you know, as as it is today. Yeah. Really? Yeah, man, it's it's awful. <clears throat> it's never been that bad. I mean, not even during the Trump administration that was pretty hard on immigration and Mexicans and everything. I mean, this this time around with this administration, that relationship is going south super fucking quick uh, in every in every single um, issue, you know, but specifically on security. Um, the uh, cooperation between both countries it's uh, shitty I'm, I can say it's not for the best maybe for Mexico I, I understand what the Mexican administration is trying to do which is gain independency and say like okay my issues I'm going to take care of my issues and you take care of yours because your help has not helped very much right funding the fucking drug cartels um, shipping drugs in exchange for fighting the guerrillas back then and all that shit it's not working for us right for mexico and mm -hmm. i understand that but at the same time you have to keep certain diplomacy right certain relationships especially because we're so tied together and this administration is closing they just closed this special um unit in mexico handled by the dea that has been going for fucking ever and that was the unit that uh, capture El Chapo and several other uh, main kingpins and the Mexican government just closed that out of the fucking blue they're just like nah this is a fucking corrupt organization it's closed and that was a main issue for the US government it's like how the fuck are you closing um, the DEA had forever for years had um, these uh, operational plane uh, installed in Mexico in the Mexican airport and the Mexican government just asked them to take that plane out of Mexico you know so it's like okay take your fucking DEA plane out of Mexican soil, get it back to the U.S. Uh, so they had to, and that was pretty hard, a hard fucking act against the U.S., right, cooperation. Um, <coughs> the U.S. arrested El General Cienfuegos, uh, one of the main um, army, top army guys in Mexico, and Mexico had to go in and rescue that guy and set him free in Mexico. So they got, Mexico got in full-on government to say, we need you to give us back uh, Cienfuegos, which is like the baddest motherfucker arrested at a U.S. airport for helping the Sinaloa cartel openly. And he was arrested under DEA custody. And Mexico went up to say, okay, I'm going to kick out every single one of your agents and, di and diplomats in because Mexico. Because we were holding him? If you don't release him back to us. So that's the extent Mexico is going against their relationship to, in, in the, to the U.S. And China is watching all of that shit, right? They're like, oh, you're fighting with, with the U.S., so let's be friends, right? Dude, that's fucking scary. <laughs> it's crazy, man. So, essentially, the entire Mexican government is controlled by the, by the cartels. Yes. I think, I think right now it's really hard. How much influence do they have on, like, the, the very top, like, the president? Like, how much influence is there? I think, I think a lot. I think a lot. More, more, than, more than everybody thinks, really. Um, I'm not saying that it's as, like, they call the president and say, like, what to do. But they definitely have the means to pressure his agenda, right? By taking out uh, armed people into certain strategic places. Like, let's say the Mexican government is trying to open a new oil refinery uh, or processing center or whatever, or a new hospital in some city. So the bad guys will go and, I don't know, kill a couple of doctors or, um, you know, shoot the whole fucking scene or kill a family around the area where they were supposed to set up a new school, mm -hmm. stuff like that, to pressure the government to do their will, right? To hand them contracts for the construction of a street of, or a hospital or of a new, I don't know, 
department complex, whatever. They're making a lot of money out of legal money, legal contracts of construction specifically for roads that they need to transport um, drugs, right? So they're like, we need this road. And the Mexican government were like, well, there's no fucking money to do that, bro. I was like, all right, so let's pressure your fucking government one way or another. So you feel like you have to build that fucking road. Right. And, right, and right. that we're going to get that contract also. So they own the construction company that's building the road? Or um, they are some, they're somehow yeah. getting a percentage or extorting them somehow? I guess a good percentage of the whole, um, of the whole construction around Mexico is handing, is handed by cartel members right wow on their on their, their um that's fucking bananas bro. it's crazy man that's <clears throat> i mean it's 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 to the, up to the point where it's really hard to say that there is a government and the, that there is a cartel or, mm -hmm. or cartels it's the same it's the, the work like so what do like you that. do like what do you like how do you handle that how does the u.s handle that like especially when not only is it a fucking narco state but when you have china siphoning fentanyl through there it's like a it's like a it's like a proxy or just like a trojan horse mm -hmm. to get fentanyl into the united states which is fucking fucking up young people and like, like killing a lot of fucking yeah. people in the country i don't know man i don't know I, so I, that's wild. that's a, that's a fucking question i i make myself like every time but i guess i guess the u.s does better to a country when it stays out of it you know like when when they don't involved actively in trying to help a country, right, right, right. When they are, when they stay away from that country, that's that's better for that country, right? Because I mean, unlike uh, Ukraine, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a, that's a totally because they're a war, full on war, right? That, yeah, that's that's a that's a that's actually a war. It's not a threat, a civil threat, or something like that. Right. And what would it be if the U.S. hadn't put billions of dollars of weapons and shit in, into that country? You know, exactly. Would, would it be a war? Yeah. Who well, knows? yeah. Who knows? But how how did Afghanistan end up? Right? Didn't end up well for right. either um honduras guatemala mexico el salvador panama venezuela cuba mm. every single one of the haiti every single one of those countries has had a lot of intervention intervention by the u.s mm -hmm. trying to help mm -hmm. and all of those countries are dude, devastated <clears throat> devastated and and it's and it's becoming a, an issue and it's backlashing into the u.s because a lot of the migrants are from those specific countries where the u.s had um stepped in right a lot of the migrants from those countries are from what do you mean yeah like basically the u.s trying to help those countries and fucking them yeah. up more than actually help is backlashing into the u.s because most of the migrants getting into the u.s are actually from those countries right they, right right right, right. yeah that makes sense a lot of people from haiti venezuela cuba mm -hmm. mexico salvador guatemala mm. is anyone else talking about this thing with about how all this stuff is coming in from china is, is any is any like <coughs> one reporting on that mainstream like because i haven't seen that anywhere until i really started digging into it the thing is it it, it looks very conspiranoic right the thing is that narrative uh, for editors, it's a conspiracy theory, even though you hand out proof, right? Even though if you are bringing like interviews and all that stuff, it's still f for most editors, it feels like, eh, I think we're more on the conspiracy theory right there, right? And I'm like, well, because there's no, there's no definitive proof, obviously, because that course. that's their intention, exactly. But if it was their intention, that's what they would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Because of course, I mean, if you're an, when you're an editor, what you need is proof, right? And you will need a proof of the Chinese government saying, "Yeah, let's fucking kill a lot of U.S. citizens with fentanyl going through mm -hmm. Mexico." No one's gonna fucking say that, right? Mm. But you can have a proof by showing where is all this fentanyl coming from, mm -hmm. and why is it not affecting Mexico? Right. Right, it's affecting specifically the U.S. It's not drug. I mean, Mexico and <coughs> it's shipping drugs all over. Right, they're shipping shit to Europe, Middle East, a Asia, Africa. They're shipping fucking drugs to every single other fucking country. The U.S., of course. But fentanyl, it's only being shipped to the U.S. Fentanyl, it's not shipped to Europe. It's not shipped to Asia. It's not shipped to Middle East. It's shipped specifically to the U.S. And that's because that's what the bosses in the cartels are asking right 
this is only for the U.S. This, this will not. Oh, why only for the U.S.? Because there's only people taking that shit in the U.S. Only? I guess that's what makes it fucking suspicious, right? Is it because there is only a demand in the U.S., which is fucking weird that it, that the demand will be only in the U.S. Didn't happen with coke. Didn't happen with the heroin. With, didn't happen with weed. That goes everywhere. Everywhere and meth. You know, that that demand is worldwide. So it's the same fucking drug worldwide, right? What has has the amount of coke gone down has like the the amount of money and and the the volume of cocaine being trafficked has that gone down since it's, no it's actually going up as well um you know the u.s also has funding a lot of the drug war in colombia against against drug traffickers and they just nabbed this uh, narco called otoniel right who are they funding uh the colombia government they're funding the Colombian government mm -hmm. to fight the to fight the drug cartels okay. they just <clears throat> arrested this guy who was like a chapel for uh colombia right it okay. was called otoniel uh, but when you look again at the figures of coke being shipped from Colombia into into the U.S., it's at an all times high, and it's again, it's like it's not working. Your strategy is obviously not working. The Colombia has never produced more cocaine in the whole fucking history as of right now. Wow, that's <laughs> crazy. Really? So they're getting all the big bosses, and their organizations keep shipping shit tons of money maybe it's because of covid maybe people are just sort of lonely yeah, they want to exactly. do more fucking yeah. drugs they want to do more coke sure and eat yeah. more pills covid definitely skyrocketed the the uh the uh, drug business and that's for sure yes and it's the same is the same st is it as violent have you ever been to colombia yeah is it the same what's the main differences between like the cartels in colombia and the cartels in mexico I think Colombia is, I think, I think Mexico, it's Colombia 15 years back, right? Uh, I think we're moving into that direction, straight, straight forward. Meaning it's more... Meaning it, Colombia got so mixed, the drug trafficking problem and politics, so fucking intersected. You know, Pablo Escobar, he used to be like a congressman. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a president. Mm -hmm. So he mixed the whole fucking organization with politicians and politicians on his organization. So that changed the whole fucking thing. Um, also, the, um, the guerrillas that used to be guerrillas and not traffickers, but now they're traffickers saying they're guerrillas, right? There, there's this group called Clan del Golfo, which is basically Cartel del Golfo. Um, but they say they're 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 called the autodefensa the uh, autodefensas gaitanistas de Colombia, right? So they are a, a guerrilla or a self defense group. Uh, but it, they're not; they're fucking traffickers. Right. The FARC, las fuerzas uh, revolucionarias de Colombia, the main guerrilla group in Colombia. They used to be a guerrilla, right? Fighting against the government and trying to uh, gain autonomous uh, uh, territories and all that shit. They are the ones cooking more cocaine than every other single organization in Colombia. Dealing in Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, they're fucking everywhere. They're huge. And they used to be guerrillas, right? So Mexico, we don't have guerrillas, but we're about to. All of those groups from autodefensa. What does guerrilla mean? Again? Uh, guerrilla, guerrilla. Guerrilla. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. You said it the proper way, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Going right over my yeah, head. Yeah. Yeah. Guerrillas. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So <clears throat> all of these guerrilla groups. Mm, I mean, they're not. They're they're traffickers. These guys, those guerrillas, right? Mm. We're not. Mexico is still not at that in that in that point in time right now, but we're going to. We're going to. I mean, these guys. I don't know if you've read these. Um, manual there's a u.s army manual on insurgencies and counterinsurgencies movement and there is established like a one by one point on how, how does an insurgency group builds up right and they start basically by unstabilizing governments doing certain actions and and if you look at that guide and you look at what's ha happening in mexico it was like, dude, we're on the final fucking phase of these guys becoming an, ins an armed or mixed insurgency, which is like a drug trafficking slash insurgency groups operating in Mexico. They're not only cartels right now. Um, that's why I usually refuse to call them um, cartels or drug cartels. And it's more like um, organized uh, I insurgencies, right? Because it's 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 totally different now. It's not the same. They're wearing military vests, wear military dress. Yeah. Um, they have uh, 
uh, they have their armed groups, which is one of the requirements of the insurgency, right? You have leadership, and then you have a circle of uh, an, an armed group that is going to protect you or attack, mm -hmm. or, you know? And then outside, you have what is called social basis, which is basically the people supporting you on certain region you want to get control of. Okay. And they're getting a lot of social basis as, ar ar around Mexico. All of those gaps we were talking earlier, um, that's how they are getting social basis all through Mexico. So people today respect more a drug trafficker than a politician. If they say, who is, who's giving you more? Who, whose side are you going to be of? And they're like, of course I'm going to be on the side of El Mayo instead of the fucking governor of my state. Right. Because they feel they're giving more. And that, that's how they're gaining social basis. And that's fucking crazy because that means when the time comes, they can't ask people to go out against their government and throw a fucking government out and they will step in, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and you'll have a fucking mess. One of the articles that you wrote was about <clears throat> their problem with um, getting guns, uh, dealing with the gun manufacturers in the U.S. Like mm -hmm. there was, wasn't there some sort of law that had to get passed to sort of like restrict the amount of guns being trafficked? Because like the NRA had something going, like the NRA had some sort of thing going on with the gun manufacturers where they were able to illegally ship guns into Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the thing is <clears throat> in Mexico, it's almost impossible to get a gun legally, right? Uh, to get a gun. By the way, you want a drink? Yeah, I didn't of offer course. you this earlier. It's uh, it's fuck. It's whiskey. It's actually not bad. It's pretty good. Looks good. It's man. like single yeah. malt whiskey. Awesome. Let's go for it. Oh. So yeah, it makes it good. It's really hard to. Do you like it straight or you want ice? It's uh, ice it's, it's, I'll, I'll do straight, man. Straight. Very cool. To 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 get a gun, right? The the legal way. Dude, like that. That looks super go, good. It is good. <laughs> Um, but if you try to get a gun illegally, you'll have it like, cheers, cheers, man. Let's get fucked up and talk about narcos. <laughs> yes, let's do that. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> not, to, not to drink water and talk. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Should have offered it earlier. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, man. Wow. This is good. Pretty good. So, so yeah, I mean that, and, and again, only the bad guys are, uh, are having guns in Mexico. They they are the only ones with guns in Mexico, right? If I want to get a gun in, in Juarez to protect myself, that's fucking impossible. There is no way. They say there is a way, the proper way, and you can apply for a fucking license or whatever, but it's impossible. They're never going to get a, a, approved, right? And if you get approved, it's just going to be like a small handgun, whatever. Mm -hmm. And these guys are <laughs> dealing with fucking AKs and a lot of other like big stuff. Um, 50 calls and all that shit. And... And it's like, what am I gonna do with a fucking handgun? Yeah, that video right? that you sent me with those those kids, those foot soldiers wearing yeah. out fifty caliber snipers. <laughs> exactly, man. What the, fuck? what the fuck are you gonna do if the Mexican government is allowing you to carry a handgun against all of those fucking guys? Right. Right. So that's that that's 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 for for one side, and and the other side, it's Mexico is pushing a law to sue most U.S. Um, gun manufacturers, trying to blame them because uh, for the whole shit that it's going on in Mexico, right? So the Mexican government, what it's saying is, you are as responsible as the criminals for what is happening in Mexico. Because you know uh, that you have to bet better the people that is buying guns from you. Um, of course, the, the US companies are saying like, that's not our fucking fault. We're just selling and producing guns for a US market. And if they end up in Mexico or whatever else, that's not our problem. Mm -hmm. Um, I honestly think that's a political stunt for, from the um, from the um, this politician that wants to be president next after this uh, AMLO's administration, and he's doing good because he's getting a lot of le legitimacy in Mexico, right? Everybody's like, "Wow, he's the only one stepping up against the fucking U.S. manufacturers," mm. which I don't really think it's gonna do something. Right? Are the U.S. manufacturers selling directly to the cartels? Not directly. Well, no. not like that. Not like they're shipping shit tons of guns directly to to cartels and shit but they're getting like massive fucking orders <coughs> of shit uh, uh, lots of yeah. guns to <laughs> organizations or companies exactly. in mexico yeah okay. exactly and and that's the thing uh not only in mexico but also in the u.s because they are allowed to right but it, but if they are if they were to really vet who are who is getting their guns 
especially very specific shipments of a shit ton of fucking AKs, a shit ton of fucking AR-15s, a shit ton of 50 calls. That's that should be enough to raise the alarms and say like, okay, let's let's <laughs> let's have a look at who's buying all this shit from us, right? Maybe we should look. I mean, <laughs> and when and check when, their yeah. fucking ID or something, their background. Yeah, because when you look at them, <laughs> and I, I had I had look at the fucking lists and say like, okay, so this is supposed to be a company that is um, selling guns out of uh, whatever. Then you go and it's a small house in El Paso, in East El Paso, from a single fucking guy just sitting outside his porch. And just sitting like that and selling <laughs> guns to every fucking They would body. have to do the l s least amount of work possible to yeah. actually do any sort of like research to find out that this is like a, a 500 square foot like shack in AC Mexico. Man. AC. <clears throat> but no, they're probably, it's like a fucking billion yeah. dollar gun order. Exactly. And when I met that guy, he's a Mexican guy with, uh, called Luis as well. Um, and I was like, so here's the, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the store, but let's say, I don't know, guns um, company. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah. He's like, but this is a house. And he's like, yeah, man, I'm allowed. And I'm like, so you have a permit? And he's like, yeah, I just need to the eight send the list of buyers to the ATF every month. And I'm like, dude, but what if I come here and ask you to get two AKs, 550 calls? And are you allowed to, to sell that? And I was like, yeah, I, I mean, as, as long as you give me your, your ID. And I'm like, dude, but are you aware that most of those fucking guns are going to end up in Mexico? And it's like, dude, I have clients from whatever. I don't ask questions. I just give me your ID and I'll send them to ATF. If there's an issue, ATF will reach out to me and say like, hey, someone bought this gun from you or whatever. And I ask him like, has it happened? And he's like, yeah. And then what happened? Nothing. I mean, I'm just selling guns. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, see, well, I understand what you're saying, but still. So how long, I mean, the question is how long until fucking they start buying nukes from the U.S.? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't even Do you think, think the cartels ever buy nukes. <laughs> I don't know. But I don't think they need to, man. I think they have more than fucking enough to, to get us all on our knees, you know. I mean, it's uh, super fucking. Even a small nuke. Yeah. Like, we'll take out your state or we'll take out your city, you know, if you fuck with us. They don't. They don't fucking need to. That's the thing. They they can't take the whole fucking city if they want. Only by the amount of people. Look at what happened when they tried to capture El Chapo's son in Culiacan, right? The go Mexican government went, went full fucking on with a lot of fucking army guys, helicopters, everything, tanks, like on war to capture one guy that is actually like thirty years old, some shit like that. And when they got him in his house, he just made a call. And hundreds of fucking soldiers came out from nowhere, from the fucking sewers, from houses around, and they made a f they paralyzed the whole fucking city for the whole entire day. They started killing people. They went into the um, maximum security prison to free hundred of fucking people what? and arm all of them. Uh, all of them like started getting armed and go against the army. They went into the army. There is an army base in in Culiacan. They went there and uh, tied. A lot of uh, grenades and and how do you call it? AD, uh, like the fucking proximity uh, mines, landmines, to the gas tanks of the where the families of the soldiers were leaving, and say like, okay, man, if you don't let our guy go, we're gonna blow the whole fucking military base where your family's staying, right? And they paralyzed Holy the whole fucking city, fuck. and that happened in like what three hours? They had to let that guy go, so they they set him free. And they just went back into hiding. So if they want, they can take a whole fucking city without the use of anything else but the amount of people working under their instructions, right? God damn, bro. Yeah, that man. is so crazy. Where is El Chapo's son now? In Culiacan. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's living in the outskirts of Culiacan. Um, a lot, of course, if I knew, I, I will be... I will be getting myself five million fucking dollars. <laughs> right? If you knew a, where, yeah, because that's the uh, <laughs> that's the, that's the five million dollar question. Yeah, that's the yeah yeah yeah. That's if what, you, what if you had the opportunity to like go meet him and like interview him? Well, dude, I'm I'm, tr I'm I've been trying that for a fucking. But while. if they were like, we gotta fucking put a we gotta put a bag over your head, we gotta tie you up and throw you in the fucking bottom of a of a <laughs> truck. Wouldn't be the first time I I, I went to a place like that. <clears throat> Like all the, you know, like with shit in my head. I mean, I've, I've been in places like that in Sonora. You've been in places where they had to like literally blindfold yeah, you blindfold and take me. you there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, by yourself. Yeah, by myself. Jesus, wouldn't bro. wouldn't be the first time. So I will, I will be like, yeah, for sure, man. Let's let's do it. I mean, if 
If he offers me a fucking interview, that yeah, would be. Yeah, but massive. you just said that you would take the five million dollars or so. Where is that? No, no. <laughs> hey, if, if you if you're watching this, I'm not taking the five mil. I'm taking your interview. He definitely watches this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what was the story? There was a story about uh, you were in a safe house or somewhere, and there there was like a they ordered tacos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's that's the time where they blindfolded me and, and stuff. Oh, okay. Um, I went to meet. I went to meet one of the um, Caro Quintero's uh, family, right, operating in Sonora. Um, Caro Quintero is, is, is this um, Sinaloa cartel founder as well that got arrested, and um, he is uh, he's accused of killing Kiki Camarena, the DEA agent in, in Mexico. Um, although most of my sources said that it was not Caro Quintero, it was actually the CIA who killed this DA agent, but that's a whole other story. That's the story of Narcos, right? Oh, the last Narc, last I'm Narc. Sorry. yeah, 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 yeah. So this guy, how do you say his name again? Caro Quintero. El, <coughs> El Caro Quintero. Uh -huh. So he's still running around and he's still pretty yeah. active. He was he was in jail for several <laughs> years. After the, yeah, he got busted after the Kiki exactly. murder. Exactly, Marana, exactly, murder. And then he was in jail and then he was set free for two hours because the uh, judge said he, he, he uh, made a mistake on the ruling. <laughs> right, so the attorneys submitted a motion and the judge was like, yeah, you're totally right. Um, Kiki Camarena was not... Um, a federal official um, person in Mexico, because that was the that that's why he got so many years. He was not operating as a federal. He was undercover. He was from the U.S., so he was just like a citizen. So you just killed a regular citizen, a foreign citizen in Mexico. And I thought he worked for the DEA. He worked for the DEA, but under the Mexican law, he was not officially a federal agent in Mexico or a Mexican federal agent. And he oh, was so because that's what he, he needed that status to stay undercover. Exactly. Covert, yeah. mm -hmm. So you just basically killed a foreigner in Mexico oh, wow. and you served that time for, for that, for that um, crime, right? They set him free. Two hours later, he's like, oh shit, no, my bad. We need him back. Of course he was already hiding well protector right right <clears throat> and um yeah during those when they showed that footage and they were interviewing him and he was just like nonchalant smiling kind of like laughing and giggling and like he was very like matter of fact <laughs> answering the questions yeah. like he knew what the fuck he yeah. was doing yeah yeah yeah, yeah man. and he seemed young back then back then yeah. what year was that it was 87 exactly uh, he's yeah exactly <clears throat> and um there was a recent interview i think it was like three or four years ago when he was just recently out a Mexican journalist uh, found him and, and he gave her uh, an interview. And he is, he's like in a shitty place, I guess in the mountains, you can hear a lot of fucking rain and stuff. And he's saying like, I'm just, uh, I'm just a farmer and I did what I did, but I paid for it. And I was not involved in anything. I never even knew that guy, Camarena, whatever, that they're accusing me of, right? Um, who knows? So that, we're getting a little bit off track, but that <laughs> audio, uh, they, they recorded the audio of torturing and interrogating that mm -hmm. DEA agent, Kiki Camarena. Is that audio available to uh, uh, for no. public? No. I, so no one's ever heard it? No. I, I've been described the audio by, by um, Hector Berreyes, who is the last dark. Uh, by yeah. Hector. So yeah. Hector has heard it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hector, Hector, Hector has heard it. Mm -hmm. So it, did they have the actual full audio version of that when they made the documentary where like where they no. had, they didn't even have the full no no okay no, no. they just had like people's memory of it exactly okay. yes exactly <clears throat> um and so yeah anyways i i went to to visit like uh, a source of mine told me that they can get me a uh uh to 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 talk with one of caro quintero's family uh, a nephew from caro quintero's working and leading the organization in sonora mm -hmm. so i went there i was staying in nogales and he called me to meet him up in a place called Caborca, which is like two hours, I think, two hours or something like that from Nogales. But it was like 11 p.m., right? So when they called me and said like, hey, you need to show up here. And I'm like, I'm two hours away. And he's like, okay, so if you want, we'll be here. And I drove in the middle of the fucking night alone all through fucking Sonora to go to that shitty place. And of course, he had left already. So I was like, shit. So I was like, can you call him back? Tell him I'm sorry, I'm two hours away. I'll stay here. Stayed there for until like three in the morning. And then I drove all the way back to fucking Nogales to my hotel. The next night, again, the same shit. <coughs> call me up to meet him there again. There I am again in the middle of fucking night going back and then back because nothing happened. It was like four times that that happened. And the fifth night, 
he actually showed up showed up with a in a in a you went back for five fucking nights yeah <laughs> wow. it's like driving back and forth in the fucking middle of nowhere um and then on the fifth night he showed up in a, this beautiful tacoma you know uh and and he was like a regular fucking person with a shirt um a white guy you know he sort of like looked like you but fatter <laughs> <laughs> He was American? Yeah, he is American, but okay. I mean, well, he's a Mexican, but he's a U.S. citizen. Okay. But uh, he happened to be cuero, w- w- completely white. Okay, so he's, like, she uh, was green from Monterey. Eyes Monterey. And, Monterey. <laughs> basically, <yes. laughs> Um And we, we started talking, and, and I had an interview with him, a full interview on what he was doing and how he got involved with the cartel and Caro Quintero's organization, all that shit. And then he told me, well, so you want to go and look the uh, the warehouse? And I'm like, yeah, f- of course. So he blindfolded me, uh, put me in another car, one, one of his security guys. We started driving. I knew exactly where we were because I had fucking driven that road five nights in a row. <laughs> so I knew every single bump, right. every single turn, right? So we were into uh we went into a small town called Pitiquito, which is in between where I was staying and the, that <coughs> city, Caborca. Um but not I don't know exactly where, but I knew we were like somewhere deep into Pitiquito. And then he showed me like this small house. Uh and he's like, That's the warehouse. So I entered the house and there was nothing, just like an old man having a tecate, right? And I'm like, But where is it? You have no drugs here? Like and he's like, It's fucking full of drugs. And I'm like but where on the roof and it's like open the open the warehouse so this guy started like sweeping the it was a dirt road started like sweeping the dirt road um and then he he pulled like a like a like a i don't know like a thing like a, a door yeah like a hatch like double hatch and then they had a stairs uh and then back down back there inside that that thing underground it was like full of fucking weed it was only weed but it was like completely packed it was a place i think it was bigger than this place twice this place i guess mm-hmm. and it was like completely fucking packed with with bricks of of weed and they had the whole whole um accounting uh notes there so they i could take a look at everything they allowed me to get a look of everything so we recorded the whole fucking thing it was a it was for a show called mm-hmm. uh, dope on netflix um oh, so you're filming yes i was i was producing a that, that documentary for netflix and um so we filmed the whole fucking thing, and then we went out. I don't smoke weed, uh, but the the two guys that I was with, um, the cameraman and 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 another um, cameraman as well, they both they do smoke. They, they're um, they're from the UK, and they were like, "This this fucking weed smells good." And I told him like, "Hey, my guy said your weed smells pretty pretty good." And he's like, "Yeah, have it." So he grabbed a bunch of fucking weed and he's like. That's all yours. No way. So these guys started like rolling and smoking, that's and we're like having fun, awesome. and we're like, "That's pretty cool." And it's like, "Usted no fuma?" And I'm like, "No, I don't smoke." It's like, "No, me either." You know, it's like, "Oh, that, that's that, that's good." I He's mean, DEA, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, we were just like waiting for them to finish their fucking joints, and and I was dr- having a tecate and small talking, uh, and then he got a got a call on his radio. Uh, they usually use like encrypted communication, so someone talked to him on his uh, walkie and said a couple of code words, you know, something. Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Okay." We kept talking, and then like five minutes later, ten minutes later, someone l- the call again, and then he started like getting tense. And I'm like, "Is everything okay?" He's like, "Sort of." Can you give guys please give me your IDs? And I'm like, "Is, is it all good? Just give me your IDs." And I'm like, "All right." So I handed my my um wait my do these ID. cameramen you're with they speak spanish no they didn't so you so were the other one had, yeah i had to tell them like hey guys we need to hand out all oh, these guys are like why and i'm like not really sure let's just play by his rules and let's see what happens right and they're like okay and they just <laughs> gave me their passports and i handed over the, their passports and my texan id and he's like aren't you from what is and I'm like, yeah, I was born in Juarez, but I have the dual citizenship. And it's like, so why <coughs> don't you have an ID from Juarez? And I'm like, I don't have an ID from Juarez. I have a U.S. a Texas ID. All right, okay. And I'm like, is is everything fine? And then he got a call again, and then he talked, and then he told me, you know what, Luis, uh, I'm trusting you. So the first guy who's gonna go out tonight, it's gonna be you, because if something happens to me right now. It's going to be on you. Because I'm not going to go after those guys. Those guys are from the UK. 
and I'm gonna get into a fucking mess if I go after those guys. Although they're gonna get what they deserve, but I'm gonna go after you because you brought them here. And I'm like, yeah, I know, man. And, and after your source, which was called Luis also. And it's like, and after Luis, your tocayo, right? So that is your source. My source, okay. the, the guy who introduced me to this guy. Right. And I was like, but what happened? And it's like, I have three rings of security and there is a convoy of federal, of federales, and they already crossed the second ring of security. The third ring of security, it's just right here in this block. So if we see them here getting across that, we're gonna engage into a shootout. And that means they're, they're following you. I'm gonna assume that they're following you. And I'm like, <coughs> dude, I mean, I don't even have my phone and you know, well, not, not on though, it's, it's off. And it's like, whatever, man. Uh, so let's uh, let's pray for 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 them to stop at the at the, at the at the last checkpoint. And I'm like, all right, we stay there. I was fucking shitting myself. <laughs> I was like, please, 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 because he didn't even. We weren't even talking anymore. We were just like sitting there, all quiet. You know, before small talking and laughing and having a beer, Alpha Zone and was like poof, silence. Silence. And I was like, fuck, fuck. And I would look around. So like, there's nothing but fucking mountains around here. So there's no fucking way I can run to anywhere. So I, I, we stayed there, and then they call him again, and I was like, "Fuck!" And then, uh, and then I called here. They told him, uh, "No, they, they were they were coming to eat some tacos to the to the corner with the with the, with a, an old lady that sells tacos in the <laughs> corner." <laughs> and I was like, "Shh, mother! Couldn't you fucking pick a different place to go for tacos?" <laughs> <laughs> it's Uber Eats. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he was like, "No, they're eating tacos, so you're good. There you go. Let's go." And Bro. Then we, 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 we drove back straight that back. That kind of shit is terrifying. Man. That was fucking crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got scared that time. Fuck. <laughs> um, one of the things I want to ask you. I was in uh, a couple of years ago. I think two years ago. I was. I stayed in uh, Puerto Vallarta for mm -hmm. a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and Sayulita. Yeah. And uh, I read a couple articles saying that those areas, including places like Cancun, are really highly sought after turf for oh. the cartels because or not for the cartels but mainly for like the smaller drug gangs mm -hmm. because they want to sell to the tourists are uh, those areas those places like cancun and uh and uh puerto vallarta mm -hmm. are those places becoming more and more dangerous yeah definitely um <clears throat> the thing is you're not only dealing with street dealing which is a lot of fucking money for tourists right i mean mm -hmm. the tourist um the tourism industry uh, buying drugs in tourist areas it, it leaves a lot of money because they overprice every single fucking bag of cocaine and shit so they make a big buck out of that but also most of their resorts if you look at the owners of their resorts not mexican it's a lot of Ital italian people from yeah. romania yeah. russian it's a lot of fucking mafia from we're talking mafia from from korea korea um italy russia romania uh, all over the fucking world, but they, mostly those four places. They own a lot of the real estate in those tourist, exactly. high tourist traffic areas because they're they're um, laundering money from their own organizations through those uh, resorts, right? Holy and fuck! And not only laundering money, but also it's uh, it's it's private land. It's so it's private beaches. So by night, you will see a lot of fucking small boats um, the three in the morning getting there and going out from there right so they're shipping a lot of drugs also from there out from mexico mexican drug to europe right to a lot of like europe destinations or asia destinations wow um so, so they're making a big buck out of there so mexican cartels are uh try we're well not not trying but they're looking to break a bigger deal with them right to make the biggest part not only not only asking them for um look what they call uso de suelo which is basically i'm charging you for operating on my turf you're giving me a percentage of what you're doing mm. uh, on whatever you, the fuck is that you're doing anything because they're they're on um, human trafficking, you know, <coughs> sex trafficking, selling s uh, drugs, shipping drugs, laundering money. Those places are hot spots for fucking crime. All of that shit. Um, so Prostitutes, the, exactly, cocaine. Yeah. So 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 the Mexican cartels are like, well, we don't want just a piece of your business now. We want in, and they started like fighting, killing, moving, and the whole fucking dynamics yeah. started changing around those places. So right now, they're becoming 
dangerous places, not because they're ta targeting uh, tourists, but because there's a there's a fucking war between the tourists two, so. are just like collateral damage. Collateral damage, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you heard that they're killing, they killed a Canadian, they kill an Asian, like uh, almost all of them were targeted because they were part of the organization, right? Oh, These two Canadian, okay. Asian Canadian, I, was, right. I think they were like Korean or Vietnamese Canadian. Mm -hmm. What's the deal with that fucking monkey that got shot? Yeah. <laughs> the narco monkey. What the, is the story behind that, that fucking that, thing? <laughs> that story is like, I don't know if to actually laugh or cry because I mean, <laughs> a four, I mean, why will you kill a fucking monkey, right? First of all, why will you have a monkey completely oh, there tactical is. dressed, right? Rest in peace. <laughs> Rest in peace. My el, el Bro, those things are fucking, can be ruthless when they want to be. Really? I've, yeah. I mean, I, I know I had a friend that had one, but I was so fucking scared of Bro, I've seen videos right? of those things like ripping people's scalps off and yeah. shit, ripping their faces off. I mean, I was completely Your scared. balls off. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's what they do, Brian. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. I don't know if they were actually <laughs> using him as a... Uh, I don't know, it's a weapon, you know, like attacking people or protection mm -hmm. or whatever, or they just find it cool because he was properly dressed, right? He had his his tactical vest and the and the camo sweat like sweatshirt. Yeah, I mean, he was all dressed up. What 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 was going on? Like, why did he get shot? Uh, he was uh, apparently he was the pet of, of one of the uh, one of the guys from La Familia Michoacana, which is uh, which is a cartel in central Mexico in in Michoacan and, and Mexico State. They uh -huh. are they're huge. So apparently what happened is that a few a couple of members of the La Familia Michoacana went to the um uh, police station, the state police station to to shoot the the police station, to actually shoot on the the police officers. So they started into a gunfight, they started chasing them. They went into a uh, they, they tried to hide in one of their branches uh in Mexico state. And one of the bosses uh, had a, a spider monkey with him mm -hmm. and so he was like a casualty of the gunfight but i'm not sure i'm not sure, sure about that because there's that photo of that monkey laying on the side of a man allegedly his owner but there's another photo uh, uh, i think it was not as popular as that one there was another photo where he was actually on top of him oh really so i don't on know on top of his he, owner uh-huh like on the on, on his chest wait go up scroll up there's one with like a red circle yeah, click that one. No, he's on his yeah, head, on exactly. his like shoulders. And, and I think that's a different <clears throat> different photo that was around, but was not from him. Um, yeah, I mean. So he was just essentially a pet of one of the big narco guys. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know if if, I, if during the shootout they kill him or they actually execute the monkey, right? It's, it's I mean it's it's weird to even be wording those saying those words that's so <laughs> fucking weird bro execute a monkey yeah man what if they put like a fucking suicide vest on him or something they yeah i mean have the monkey like run out and, then and now he has his own corrido right his own songs it's the, it's, they're called narco corridos which are songs that tell the story of big narcos right so el chapo has the narco corrido el mayo has his own several corridos and now the spider monkey has his own narco his corrido. Own narco yeah. song? Someone composed the narco song for for really? Changuito, <clears throat> saying that it was not his time to go, and then he left a legacy. <laughs> Click on that one with him in the clouds and the cross. Yeah, that one. <laughs> yes. Shit, man. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Mexico, right? You don't know if to actually to, to laugh or to cry. <sighs> It's just crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pobre changuito. So the Russian mafia is just specifically there just basically because they're shipping. They're there to control stuff that they're trying to ship back to Russia. Or, yeah. or they're, they're, they're just trying to make money on. There's like small Russian gangs that are in there that are just trying to make money selling drugs. Both. I mean, they, they're okay. open on both. There was, a, there was a recent arrest on a guy called. Let me, let me find his name because I have it here recently. He he was not Russian. He was Romanian. Oh, Romanian. Um, I thought the Russian mafia was down there. The, yeah, also yeah, it's <clears throat> it's the Russians uh, and the Romanian uh, ma mafias down there. Um, I can't remember his name, but anyways, he uh, he was recently arrested in in Cancun because Tudor. His last name was Tudor. T U D O R, and everybody knew that he controlled most of the. Uh, um, 
hotels operating in Cancun. He operated a street truck selling, a sex trafficking ring, and he was laundering money for Romanian and Russian organizations out of out of Cancun. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he was pretty fucking huge because he even got, um, there's photos and video of him uh, on a public meeting he had with Mexico top security chief, uh, Rosa Isela, whatever, mm -hmm. which is, she's the, uh, top security chief for, for, for Mexican government. Mm -hmm. He got together with her to ask her for more um, protection in Cancun because it was getting dangerous and whatever and offering also his services to yeah. if she needed something in, in Cancun and all that shit because he was allegedly a, a business owner, right? But um, but it, the Interpol had an inter, uh, uh, an international uh, investigation out of him, so he, he got arrested. His organization is still going. A lot of call centers also where he's laundering money and making a lot of fucking frauds. Um, and, and it's uh, U.S. call centers established in Mexico because outsourcing is cheaper. But he's controlling those um, those call centers in in Cancun. Aren't a lot of the fucking uh, U.S. car manufacturers based in have manufacturing plants set up in Mexico? Yeah, there are a lot of them. Like yeah. GM and like Ford, don't Ford. they manufacture a shitload of cars in yeah. Mexico? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are those controlled by the cartel at all? No, not really. But um, how the fuck do they stay like away from the cartel down there? I think they. <clears throat> I think it's that they're just not a not a huge target. I think they're more problematic than a target for the cartels, right? Because they're being more more attention. Imagine what would happen if. If you will have a cartel threatening or kidnapping or try to get into one of the fucking Ford plants, right? So I guess what they do is they deal, the not go deal with government and government ask them like, just don't fucking mess with these guys because it's a whole whole lot of inversion um, of uh, investment that they have in in Mexico. So don't mm -hmm. fuck it up, right? Mm. I guess that's what they do. Different from what they do with mining, mining companies before establishing when they're just when they're on the um, exploration. Uh, face of of a mine, um, a oh, mine. What are they? What are they mining? Uh, a lot of um, um, silver, copper, uh, a lot of minerals, and, and now lithium. Uh, there's a there's a huge fucking lithium deposit. In, in what parts of Mexico are they in, mining in, that shit? In, in the border of Sonora and Chihuahua. Imagine that, like really Sinaloa cartel controlled place. Fuck. Mm -hmm. So the mining operations. And guess who has the. Um, Guess who, who has the um, the um, contract for that? Who? China, of course. No. The Chinese company has the contract for exploiting that that mining that uh, lithium. And the cartel doesn't touch that. Yes, of course. Oh, they're, they do touch in. it. They're in. I mean, they're not oh, touching. They're, they're, they're in on it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're partners with China. Well, they're they're giving uh, protection to to the China Chinese company that is mining there. So they they made a deal with the government and with the Chinese company, mining company, that is the biggest supplier for Tesla cars, for Tesla batter batteries. Uh, so yes. Whoa, yes. dude. That's, that, that's, I mean, I've been working on that fucking story. It's still not out because I, I still need a lot of more sources and papers and untangle the fucking story. But I pitched it like a year ago. Uh, they said yes, and I'm still working on it, slowly but surely. But, uh, but yeah, that, that company... This is the biggest, uh, this is one of the biggest mining operations in Mexico. It's the biggest in Mexico and one of the biggest in Latin America. And it's owned by China in partnership with the Sinaloa cartel. Well, it's, it, right now, it's only the contract for exploration, right? To explore okay, just how testing. much uh, lithium there is or whatever. But there are studies already proved that it's the biggest deposit of lithium. So they're just setting up. They say on paper, mm -hmm. they say they're just setting up and, and, and exploring if there but is. But they could very easily be already taking but it. But when you go <laughs> there and talk to the um, to the residents around the area, to the local residents, it's a very small town in the outskirts of in the middle of fucking nowhere. Mm -hmm. They are actually now working on setting up the whole fucking plant, right? So I'm like, but aren't they they're just exploring? And they're like, no, no, we're setting up. We're, we have contracts to work on construction and we're setting up to start mm -hmm. exploiting the, yeah. the mine, right? Mexico is threatening to um, nationalize all lithium because they say it's it belongs to Mexican government, but it's still... The, the, that I'm an, I'm, I'm, I barely got out of public high school, so you got to explain to me what so nationalized means. That, that, means uh, that means that the whole uh, lithium will 
belong to Mexico. So they will give okay. a permit for you to, or for China, or for whoever, to exploit the and do the job. But the uh, actual um, mineral, it, it's it's Mexico's property. Got it. Right. So okay. that, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, <clears throat> okay. The Mexican government is it's threatening companies and doing that, and of course it's making a lot of fucking people nervous about that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but for the time being, they handed the contract of exploration to a China company. It, under a subsidiary, like it's like a, under a smaller company, um, a partner company. Uh, Mexican company that didn't exist until like two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. It's called Bacanora Lithium. Bacanora Lithium. Bacanora Lithium. lithium. Okay. Uh -huh. So that's supposed to be the Mexican company. But that Bacanora Lithium, when you go on their webpage and see who's the owner of Bacanora Lithium, is this biggest China company that is the main supplier for lithium uh for Tesla, right? Holy so shit. So there's, there's an interesting thing going on there. And when I spoke with some of the Sinaloa cartel members around that area, they were like, I was like, how's that playing out with you guys? Because I know that's your territory. And they told me, no, we got hired to give out protection while they do the work. And I'm like, by who? It's like by the Chinese company, by, by Bacanora, right? By Bacanora Lithium, mm -hmm. the Mexican company, but it's owned by this Chinese right. biggest company. So they're protecting the area. That means they <coughs> are... Threatening, kidnapping, and killing families that don't want to sell their land they owned to the to the company, right? They're setting prices for the Chinese company. So if the Chinese company wants to pay them, I don't know, one buck for a, a I don't know, a mile yeah. of land or whatever, mm -hmm. and they don't want to sell, then the Sinaloa cartel jumps in and, say, and start threatening those guys or killing them until they sell the land for no what the Chinese company wants. Way. Uh, so it's a big fucking shit going on that with lithium, and it's I mean it's under the radar of course because in on paper it's still and then on the news it's still on exploration. We're not even sure there is lithium there. Oh my but god! Uh, where else are the is this company in China getting the lithium from? Where they're selling it? To, they're the Tesla's biggest supplier. I think it's Bolivia. Uh huh. Um, and I don't know if you if you go into that company if you go to Bacanora Lithium and then you find the. I have all the fucking documents. And they're getting from, from a lot of places. Bro, China is balls deep in Mexico. And not only in Mexico, man. I mean, they're the biggest. They have Tesla by the balls. They have Elon Musk, the, bigger, the biggest fucking, I guess, the biggest fucking um, businessman in the U.S. Yeah. By the fucking balls. Richest guy in the world. Yeah. If they have lithium, they're going to control the fucking future of, of cars. <clears throat> uh, Ford is going to start... Uh, making a lot of fucking uh, I cars. think every car making right They're every call yeah, yeah. I think yeah. somebody said that I think it was somebody in the Biden administration said that by 2025 90% of cars in the US will be electric mm -hmm. so I mean if they control one of the biggest or the biggest lithium um, deposit in Mexico or in Latin America China is gonna have are there any Teslas available. in Mexico yeah people yeah. drive Teslas yeah not I just somebody not showed me a video yesterday of in California there was like fucking a line around two blocks wrapped mm -hmm. around two blocks twice to waiting in line their, to get the charge that was uh that charge was their Teslas. Th that's an old video from to that 20 2019 I think oh is it Thanksgiving Fuck, it I was got like swindled. yeah <laughs> it's a uh, it's uh it, it was called something like the uh the Tesla uh, something whatever but mm -hmm. it, it was like uh, there was no electricity or uh, some, something happened, but whatever. People on Thanksgiving had to go into that specific place to charge their, their right. Tesla's, but it's an old video. So, so. It's a crazy. I, the thing, the only thing I worry about it with Tesla is electric cars is that in Florida, we get a lot of fucking hurricanes yeah. and we lose power for multiple days on end. Yeah. At least once or twice a year during hurricane season. I think that's going to be an issue, right? So I think that like, that's the one reason. Like, only that one little thing. Like, that one no, little I'm, thing is like makes me fearful of it. But, but like, I, think about all the. I don't like. It's weird when you compare it to all the benefits. I'm sure the out benefits way farther outweigh mean, the. When you th really think about it, those fucking benefits are not really benefits. I mean, supposedly the benefit is um, for um, the environment, right? Right. They're not going to be emissions. Uh huh. Right. But what are you gonna do without those, all those fucking batteries? What are you doing your, with your iPhone, right? Right. With your phones and and iPads and tablets. <clears throat> what do we do with all that shit? It's become 
it, it it it's waste that it's gonna be there for fucking years, contaminating the what fucking is, what environment. What do they right? do with it? You know, yeah. they bury it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, m many of us we just your cameras or whatever the batteries. Yeah, many of us just fucking throw it in the trash, and mm. that's contaminating a lot, right? If you do it properly, you go into a deposit, right, to 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 leave your batteries and iPhones mm -hmm. and all that shit. But but what are they? Well, Elon's whole thing is like we're eventually it's it's inevitable that we're gonna run out of fossil fuels at one point that's yeah, what he says probably. so it's we, we might as well start now because we're going to run out of fossil yeah. fuels but i think even he said he said that the um the batteries the lithium that we're using to make these batteries is not the best option he's like we eventually got to move past that and figure out how to get into nuclear powered cars like he he talks about getting into nuclear i mean it, it, i don't know but but honestly with with the lithium it's like okay the batteries are gonna start piling up on your fucking backyard every mm. time they they don't work right right, right. contaminating maybe <clears throat> more than the emissions of a fucking gas car mm -hmm. and the other thing is like the mining for lithium it's uh it's called open mining which is the worst fucking thing that open ever mining? happened yeah it's not yeah. it's not under the ground mining they just basically blow up full fucking uh mountains and shit and the and the and the, and the mining it's it's uh, it's open. It's at the open, right? It's not closed or underground. Right. And that shit contaminates like a hundred percent more than any other fucking type of mining. That that it's saying too much, right? Like, like underground mining contaminates a fucking lot because it's exploiting the land. Open line mining, it's like a hundred percent worse. So really? to get in order to get lithium, it's open mining. What kind of damage does the li open lithium mining do? Like, what is it? it contaminates the atmosphere like i think the atmosphere yeah exactly goes straight to the atmosphere and and the i think the whole um explosions that you need mm -hmm. to do in order to get to the to the lithium also mm -hmm. are very like harmful for the environment uh i think the uh, apparently like it, it also has a lot of emissions um yeah so i think it's i think it's like when we talk about lithium i think it's just a trend a, a trend Mm -hmm. You know, like like saying like it's cool cars and it's and it's a cool trend. Yeah, but not really, not necessarily better than what we're doing right now, right? Right. Yeah, um, I ha I had one for a while and we sold it because I had so many problems. And I think I, we're looking at getting one of the uh, diesel cars. Yeah. One of the big SUVs that come with diesel because it's way better. Even yeah. No, diesel's worse for yeah. the environment. <laughs> <Yeah>. I mean, <laughs> we're the, going from yeah, yeah. electric to diesel. The diesel, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. But I think one one of the one of the solutions wouldn't it be to actually have maybe um lithium driven public transportation like instead of using a fucking car you're you're using a railroad or a mm -hmm. or, or a fucking bus <clears throat> and then we're we're using a collective fucking right car right we're right. using a bus we're using a train or some shit like that mm -hmm. and it's and that's electric and that's not making emissions so using batteries but not a single two or three batteries for per home, right? Right. And less traffic, mm. less of that shit. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, already less of it because this is the way the economy is, or the way that people have been working since COVID. Everyone works fucking from home yeah, now. Yeah, like yeah, nobody. Yeah. Exactly. Like, and that too, yeah. That yeah. measure, that, I mean, it, it hel it, it's helping, right? Yeah, and I'm I sure even, especially in your industry, in journalism yeah. and then publishing and stuff like that, I'm sure I'm sure 99% of fucking reporters and yeah. journalists are working just straight from home exactly. and reporting on stuff from home. And that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. that's a big push for the environment, right? Stay fucking home. Don't move. Yeah. Don't commute. Do you ever think about like, think about the idea if in the future this whole america mexico china thing turned into like what's going on right now with russia ukraine and the u.s do you think that could ever fucking happen like a sort of like a war sort of how like ukraine is just like this proxy area that the u.s is using or that the u.s is using to push against russia and to fight against Russia. And it's like this middle ground. Mm -hmm. It's like this turf that they're using to wage the war between <coughs> you at the U S and Russia, mm -hmm. because you know, it's their, it's Russia's main border between the rest of the EU, the rest of Europe yeah. <clears throat> and half of Ukraine is divided. Half of it's pro Russia, half of it's pro EU. Um, and it just, from what I'm like understanding from this, it seems like, it's almost the same thing with China 
and the U.S. and Mexico kind of just being mm -hmm. that fucking middle ground. Where yeah, they're, they're using, exploiting Mexico to fucking hurt the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure it goes the other way as well. Yeah. But, like, it seems like it's kind of the same thing. It, it, it might be, man. I mean, I, I don't know if a, a proper, like, high-intensity war is what, what is happening in Ukraine, but maybe, like, a low-intensity war, right, where you don't have right. missiles and, you know, right. all that stuff, like a proper fight, but you're using it as a proxy. What I'm not sure of is if... Um, I'm sure that China is using Mexico as a proxy, and I think that's going to be happening more and more intense through the years but um but i'm not sure that the u.s can use mexico as a proxy to china right no i, I think don't the think so. u.s is gonna go what taiwan maybe taiwan yeah there's a deal where they legally have to defend taiwan right uh -huh. yeah so i think taiwan is gonna become more like i think taiwan is more on the verge of being a proxy uh well, I, I think war. it's uh, I've heard people say that it's basically inevitable that China is going to try to take over Taiwan. <laughs> and I think that's where that shit is going to happen. And we're legally obligated to defend them. Exactly. Or turn them into a porcupine or whatever and try so, to keep them safe. Yeah. So maybe maybe Mexico just becomes like, s like leverage or something yeah, exactly. for China. Yeah, exactly. It's so weird this whole geopolitical balance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. It's so crazy. And it's crazy for for the middle ground countries, right? Like Mexico, especially like, the like middle ground countries. We're not fucking with anyone. <laughs> Why are you, you are you guys fighting here over whatever the, the shit you're doing, right? Because I mean, fentanyl is it's uh it's uh and indirectly hurting Mexico as well. I mean, we're not having an issue on people using fentanyl. But it's being cooked in Mexico. It's being shipped over from Mexico. So mm -hmm. that means the army, the U.S. is uh, pressuring Mexico to go and fight a fucking undeclared war on our, on our cities, you know. And that's affecting us and our families and everybody who lives there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's fucking bullshit. Well, what do you think it would take to get Mexico out of the state that it's in and like what what would it theoretically take to fucking get rid of these cartels and without the u.s i'm saying like independent of the u.s like what would it really take to fucking turn mexico into a a sovereign country that is not fucking corrupt and overrun by all these criminal organizations i think it will take to <clears throat> it will take a lot of fucking people to lose a lot of fucking money so I think that will change the the situation in Mexico. It will it will have and not necessarily like not not straight like okay, let's take all the money to, from these people and then now Mexico's good. But I'm talking about like if you legalize drugs, if you actually work other countries would have to legalize drugs. Yeah, exactly. All the yeah. yeah, exactly. And and Mexico including Mexico mm -hmm. well, because I mean it's a huge consumer as well, but not as the US. Mm -hmm. US definitely main consumer, Europe right now. Antwerp and uh, Netherlands. It's it's a huge fucking port for for the Netherlands are. Yeah, it's like huge. It's the, it's the biggest port right now. Getting getting drugs it's almost as as high as the U.S. I thought there was countries over there that had legalized drugs like fully. But but I, I think that's why they're using that port to get drugs. That's inside. why it's convenient. Yeah. Oh mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, and and the corruption in that port is called um, Antwerp. Uh, it's huge. Like everybody's fucking working for the cartels right there. Um, so yeah, I guess. So have it's to. the fucking, it's the goddamn fucking churches. It's it, the Christian churches that are fighting against keeping drugs illegal yeah. that are fueling all these fucking yeah. deaths, yes. bro. Yeah, man. I mean, it's that and that conservative <clears throat> thinking yeah. that drugs are necessarily bad. And you know, I it's mean, so I, fucking crazy because you think if you legalized all drugs, like deaths would a hundred percent go down. Exactly, and 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 I know what some people believe that. And so also oh, everybody's going to use it. but that's going to be a way different easier problem to solve the problem of addictions it's not right. going to be the fucking it's going to be a health issue right right it's you're, not going to be a security issue. you're fighting only the people who are abusing stuff and getting addicted and you're not fucking fighting tons of criminal exactly. organizations yeah. who are straight up fucking slaughtering people every day it will definitely need years and years of education and of helping addicts and all that shit right but it's it's going to be a different fucking mm -hmm. fight 
than actually having mm -hmm. cartels controlling full territories and killing people and killing monkeys. And killing right, kids, murdering right? innocent monkeys, <laughs> exactly. spider monkeys. <laughs> yeah, there's a country, I forget which country it is, but they have they have a, a special program there where heroin's legalized, and if you're a heroin addict, you can actually go and get like supervised doses of heroin from a doctor. Mm -hmm. And where you're not on the street fucking suffering, like using dirty needles and stuff like that. Exactly, man. I mean, the whole fucking world is, we, we, we got to a ridiculous point of hypocritical thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in every single fucking sense, right? <laughs> the uh, governments are against these uh, helpers that, that go and deliver clean needles to addicts in the streets and they go hard against them and they arrest them and put them behind Yelp those, uh, if they were like drug dealers. And it's like, dude, those guys are trying to stop AIDS from spreading right. from the use of fucking syringes, right? Mm -hmm. You should be help, helping those guys. Um, and that's the same thinking where, I don't know what happened in, in um, this recent shootout in Chicago, right? In Highland Park. And if you think about that, and it's like, dude, that it's the same thing. You're talking thing. about the parade, the 4th of July parade? Yeah, exactly. <coughs> and, 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 and what I'm talking about is like the hypocritical thinking. That guy was posting videos online he was had like millions of um, of um, listeners on his Spotify, whatever, because he, what? he was a rapper. The shooter kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are he you serious? A, yeah, he was a rapper. He was a fucking rapper. You gotta find this, bro. Yeah, he was a fucking rapper, and he had like millions of listeners, and 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 he was talking about like massive shootouts. He posted videos of how he was gonna go and shoot into like people. Like he was all all there, right? And you say like, okay, the U.S. is looking all over our fucking phones or apps they have all of our fucking information but they can't get a guy that it's openly saying that it's gonna fucking kill people it's like talking about like reproduction um right 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 they are on their apps of every girl tracking their fucking tracking their periods right yeah, my wife just fucking deleted that app off her phone because <laughs> they're there <clears throat> they're sneaking up on those fucking apps but they can't fucking sneak upon a guy openly talking to millions of people this kid's really a rapper. Yeah. Robert Cremo. He was called Awake the Awake the Something. Dude, I saw something where he put, wow, he really did have a Spotify. Yeah. Awake the Rapper. Awake the Rapper, yeah. Yeah. And I saw some sort of post where he said that he was a product, he was part of MK Ultra. <laughs> Man. The CIA's <laughs> yeah. fucking mind control. Thing. I mean, he might, I don't know if he was, but he's, uh, that's a screenshot of, like, all of those photos are a screenshot of a video he posted that is very fucking disturbing. This video wearing the smiley face shirt? Yeah. What, what are you doing in this video? Can we watch it? Uh, I think, I think it's a video, right? Can you find the video? Can we watch it? Just click on, if you click on the picture, it should pull up the video. Yeah. It pull up the article. Yeah, right there. Where it says visit. Don't put this on the screen, though, because I don't want to have to get fucking banned by YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, the, the video should be... It's, it's on his... Uh, I can't remember what's the name of his Beat Meal account. See, this is the problem, too. We're fucking talking about it on a podcast and, like, giving this guy more attention. This is yeah. exactly what he wanted. Exactly. Yeah, but it is a problem, though, because we have... I mean, I mean, the fucking... With the... Uh, all of the surveillance that the fucking NSA does on, on, on our phones on, right? and our the way that the government regulates Facebook and controls social media and tries to track people's yeah. information. So they're tracking people, <clears throat> women trying to get he health, they, right. reproductive services, but they're not tracking those fuckers, right? It's like, dude, we are all thinking wrong. We we are so fucking hypocritical. We need to we need to set that fucking straight. How right? is that gonna fucking affect? Texas, that abortion law. I heard that it's going to be like the day one you find out you're pregnant, it's completely illegal to have an abortion. I'm I'm not sure, but I'm I, that's what I'm hearing too. I don't know, man. I mean, that's uh, your state. Well, yeah, and I mean that fucking state, man. <laughs> Honestly, I'm fed up with that state. I mean, I like Texas as a as a land, but their laws are just so fuck hypocritical again, right? And, and gun not, laws, you what? What are the? How is hard is it to get a gun in Texas? It's nothing. It's nothing. What do you have to do? Nothing. Just go and <laughs> just go and get one. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> just show up with yeah. all fucking face tattoos and neck tattoos, and they'll give you one. Literally, man. No, for sure. I mean, for real. That's that's what's going on. And I mean, I'm not. I'm not. Up. I think the whole debate uh, between 
the uh, gone law, if we shall be able to or not able to, I think it doesn't really matter. Because if you look then again to Mexico, right? And if you say like, let's prohibit everyone from, ha- from, from having a gun. Nobody is gone. shooting up schools in Mexico. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> that's not happening in Mexico. But still, there's a lot of fucking people getting killed in Mexico, right? I mean, how did that work for Mexico to being mm-hmm. so strict, right? Mm-hmm. But the other way around is also, I, also, what I'm trying to say is like, it doesn't really matter. It's it's a wrong debate. It's a wrong conversation we're having mm-hmm. about like gun laws. It doesn't really matter. It has no effect into what's happening in the US with the with the sh- shootings and, and all that shit, right? It's not about guns. If, 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 if you want a gun, if it's illegal, you're gonna get one. It's gonna happen what happened in Mexico, right? right. It's easier to get an illegal gun than a legal gun. Right. If, you, if it's legal, you're gonna <coughs> get it as well. I think it's a matter of education. Those guys are product of a something that wrong on their houses on their schools right which the, guys the, the, the guys school like, shooters yeah the like, guys like exactly. the highland yeah. yeah there's something fucking wrong because yeah i don't know if if it ha- has ever crossed your mind doing some shit like that right and in most of us that grew up i don't know we you always got a bully on your school you always got bad times or whatever but you never think about i'm gonna bring a fucking ak and shoot the whole fucking school right right something has happened to those guys and they're not getting enough attention and something really fucking bad is exactly. and it's guys. not gone laws those guys aren't saying like oh i can get a gun let me go shoot i mean it's easier for them of course but it's harder in mexico but we're still having certain people fucking killed a day Dif- different problem but lives gone as well if you want something you're gonna get it if it's illegal, it's just going to cost you more. Yeah. If it's legal, it's just going to cost you less. You're going to get it. If you if you want to kill someone and have a gun and make a fucking massive shootout, the problem is not how easy it is for you to get a gun. The problem is why are you fucking even thinking about that, right? Mm-hmm. I guess that's, that's, that's the main issue. The also, uh, another part, part of the problem is the fact that the media and politicians in the U.S. Mm. specifically, they just use this as political ammunition yeah. just yeah. to get more power. Exactly. They don't give a fuck whether it's illegal or not. It's just a matter of what's going to get them more votes or what's going to get them elected. Yeah. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not one of these guys that's saying, like, let's all have weapons or whatever. I don't own and I don't plan to own. I, I just don't like weapons. You don't like weapons at all? I don't. Really? No, I, don't. I mean, no. I mean, I, I've seen just too much out of them that I... No, that's I that's interesting coming from a guy who's been around. Yeah, exactly. I've been around, been around. <laughs> been around too much to like them, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm not I'm not against them, but I'm not super fucking fond of of guns, right? Right. Um, but 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 at the same time, I think like if you make them harder to get, you're what you're gonna do is you're only gonna create a black market. Market, a right. few ones, yeah. couple of people that's gonna <clears throat> m- make tons of fucking money out of that fucking industry Mm -hmm. you don't want a black market market of guns in the u.s right that's i mean that's gonna add up to the fucking problematic yeah so prohibition whatever it is it never works never fucking works it only creates black markets it only puts more people in danger and it only feeds the pockets of a few Mm -hmm. so yeah it's a it's a weird thing like the difference between mexico and, and america is in mexico the the violence stems from an industry, right? A black market industry. It's like Mm -hmm. life or death, like trying to put food on the table and greed, Mm -hmm. like greed, like making more money and, and, and turf ego businesses and stuff like that control. And, and here, like when you're talking about school shootings, even though it probably adds up to way fewer deaths than the deaths that come from the cartels in Mexico, It's almost like it's from like things are too good here. Yeah. And you have people who are just isolated and exactly. and fucking ostracized from their fucking groups or their their school groups or wh- whatever it is. They have fucked up parents. Mm-hmm. And just like the culture here in general is so much different yeah. than there because it's like it's almost too good here. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly, man. Exactly. That's what that's what I've been talking with a lot of people living in the US and they feel like like things are just too easy in the US that yeah. it makes people sick, you know, it makes people feeling lonely and and they 
they, and the they, other countries like the big fucking the, <laughs> the Russias and the Chinas will exploit that yeah to work for the, like w- w- Russia you'll see it with like uh, propaganda and the, like the new like like the media like trying mm-hmm. to manipulate that kind of stuff or trying to trying to manipulate the mind mm-hmm. rather at least in history yeah. throughout history and then when you have things like what we're talking about with China and and fentanyl allegedly if that's what their intentions mm-hmm. are trying to manipulate the weaknesses of America that way yeah I mean and and, and again the, the media it's not helping right because mm. every single one of those fuckers they always leave uh, something like a manifesto or a video or something. They want the fucking attention and yeah. they keep getting the attention. They keep getting their names all over the fucking news, their faces, their videos, their rap songs, mm-hmm. their manifestos. It's like, let's just fucking keep ignoring those motherfuckers. So when <coughs> they go out and think about like, I'm going to shoot a lot of people for nothing because no one's going to fucking remember me anyways. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to that's gonna keep them probably it's gonna keep them like from doing that because mm-hmm. they're not gonna feel important right they're not right. gonna feel like they're gonna change something right yeah it's more of a public suicide than anything right. just like how can i commit suicide and create yeah. the most attention yeah it's like it's like the kid that's calling for attention by harming i don't know the cat his yeah. cat or his pet or whatever yeah and he's like just fucking thrown in <laughs> <laughs> fucking room. i don't know man it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing to to have an answer to mm-hmm. but uh but i'm pretty sure that that Guns has nothing to do with it. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, bro, thank you for coming all the way from Mexico and doing this. I think we're almost at like three hours, oh three and a half, three, and a half, three, two hours, forty five minutes, like that. My fucking eye went but, out of battery, bro. It's been uh, awesome. Tell uh, people watching and listening where they can find out more of your, find more of your work, your, your Substack, everything, all of the, you know, where they can follow you. For sure, man. Uh, if you go to uh, my website, L Chaparro, L C H A P A R R O dot com. You'll find my uh, YouTube channel where I'm trying to be as active as I can, but I mean I'm fucking swamped and <laughs> work. But every every time I find some interesting clips uh, when I'm embedding with cartels or with U.S. authorities, or um, I did an embedding also with the Border Patrol along the along the border um, to find out how they are arresting and who are they arresting in, along the border and that stuff. So every time I do something like that, I, I will post it in, in, in YouTube. Um, also you'll find there, uh, every single one of my stories regarding, um, cr- crime, uh, and immigration drugs. Um, and if you go there where, where it says, uh, one detail insights on security, click here. That's my Substack account where I post, um, it's more of like the raw information. It's my, it's called confidential, and what I try to think uh, of confidential is like where I post that raw stuff uh, that it's not curated or mm-hmm. edited. You know, it's so like uh, raw interviews, raw audio interviews, um, a raw article without being properly um, spell checked. Yeah, <laughs> spell checked, and you know, like all that shit or. Or yeah, exactly. More right. more like raw shit and a lot Stuff of that you like, can get out. I, I like that better because it's more raw. You can get it out when people are being more raw and trying to just get stuff out rather than sitting on it for too long. Yeah, exactly. I, I enjoy that shit more because yeah. I used to like be the same way. I used to like create like a lot of like documentary style stuff yeah. and and spend months on one project. Yeah. And when I transition to doing this stuff, it's more like it's more authentic because you can you can basically just get right to it. You can fucking like me, like fumbling through my words, trying yeah. to learn as I go. Exactly. But you're able to put out a lot more content yeah. that way. And exactly. I, and I enjoy that shit more. And sometimes in the news, you can't post like the names. You know, like who is controlling Sonora and who is controlling Chihuahua and like who who gives a fuck, right? But I I do give a fuck. And sometimes I just post photos of like this is the cartel boss for Chihuahua and this mm-hmm. state and this region, and mm-hmm. I will post like their names and photos and you know like more detailed information that it's not really making the news because it mm-hmm. might not be newsworthy but it will it will keep you um aware and informed and, mm-hmm. and educated on what's going on in, in in the whole fucking crime world in right. Latin america so yeah i guess that's the that's the way to go and and, uh, and of course my my instagram account cause sometimes i will be also embedding talking with someone uh sharing stuff that i get shared by on, your on Instagram's my, uh, awesome, bro. You're super active on it. it. I'm I love super watching. active. <laughs> I'm super active on my Instagram. I had to do one thing, you know, and I guess that's Instagram, and, and I'm posting a lot of shit there all, all the time. Cool, man. Well, I will link it all uh, in the description. And thanks again. Thank you, man. It was really fun, and thanks for the whiskey. Yep. Goodbye, world. <laughs>